Good evening and welcome to the Town Council meeting of December 4th. If I could have Councillor Breton please lead us in the pledge. Would the town clerk please take attendance? Councilor Brent. Here. Councilor Forrest. Here. Councilor Hurley. Here. Councilor Latina. Here. Councilor Lesser. Here. Councilor Brown. Here. Councilor Spinella. Here. Deputy Mayor Martino. Here. And Mayor Morandello. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the town manager has ask that we add an executive session to the meeting. May I have a motion to add that to the agenda? Move to add executive session after public comment seven and before adjournment eight. Second for that? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstains, the motion moves. Um, I've also been told that the MDC is delayed so we will hold off on that presentation. They, we're hoping that they'll be here by 7.30. So we will move into public comment. I ask that the public limit their comments to five minutes. Do we have anybody who would like to come up for public comment? Mr. Young. Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. I did not appreciate at the last meeting the way I was shut down over your five minute rule, Mayor. I think I was talking about very important business, town business, and it's obvious to me it had to have some pains to it. Pains for me, pains for all of you. Those of you who have sat on this council for more than one term, not the new people. I spoke to you last time regarding the Blum Shapiro management reports. I talked about 2011, 2013, 2015, and 2016, and I'm waiting to see what the new one looks like. I did talk to you about the non-cash, non-town cash accounts using federal identification numbers. I called, I sent an email to the manager asking for more details on this. I haven't heard from him. I also spoke about the risk assessment. And in that risk assessment, that was in the year two, 2013 when it appeared and it appeared in the 2016 issue as well, which starts right off that it is estimated that U.S. businesses, including municipalities, lose up to 7% of the annual revenue to fraud. Now, 7% is a tremendous amount of money, especially when we have a $100 million budget. That's $7 million. We have other accounts with loads of money in it, times 7%. I mean, you can look at the, the cash accounts and you can visualize what we could lose due to fraud. The unfortunate situation is the town has not acted on it all these years. And because of that, we are subject to losses. Do we have losses? I don't know. But I do know we have accounts with cash and flowing around, you end up losing. And as the auditors talk about, we have, we, have, uh, uh, we have a transfer station, we have recreation programs, we have a number of programs. We have sports programs where they collect money. And when I think back on how after a 14 year run 
for bankrupt, the bankrupt field that we have behind the high school, and you had no money to pony up after 14 years, I would suspect there's a problem there. It's too bad you folks didn't think about that. You all read this report. This should have opened your eyes. Mayor, you've been here for one, one whole term, two years. You're starting your third. You should have read this report. Tony's been here two or three terms. I don't rightly remember. And he's, he's part of the finance group between here and the finance people. He should have read that. Other ones as well. We have down the other end, Mr. Mr. Hurley, who's a, who's a CPA, he should have been on top of this. And I've come to so many meetings, I've never heard a mention of this non-town account business. I've never heard anything about r fraud risk assessments that you're working on to, to, to stabilize or at least save money. And if it was talked about in the back room, the back room is meant for personnel reasons, for employees, and, and, and for real estate transactions, if you're buying or selling. Everything else should be out here in the wide open for all of us. Yet, these reports, and I'm going to read the last two paragraphs, and I sent everybody a, a copy of this, right? You all have a copy of it? Did you read those last two sentences or paragraphs? It says, this letter should be read in conjunction with the independent auditor's report on internal control over financial reporting and on compliance and other matters based on an audit of the financial statements performed in accordance with the government auditing standards. Goes on. This communication is intended solely for the information and use of management. Members of the town council, others within the organization, federal and state awarding agencies, and pass-through entities, and is not intended to be, and should not be used by any other than these specific parties. This information, as you read it, belongs on your front page of your town web page, so everybody can see how good or bad we're doing. Mr. And, Young, and because you're, you're Mr. Young, your five minutes are up, and we look forward to And you're not going to give me an extension on, no, uh, on the fact that um, I'm really presenting to you no, your I, own errors. No, but I would like to say that the town manager has provided that information to you in an email this afternoon, and he's provided it to all of us here at our seats. Well, I haven't, I haven't turned my computer on And that's tonight. fine, but I do want to let you know he did respond to your FOI request. Yes. And you will have five minutes at the end to continue your conversation. Well, I won't be able to look at that because I. I'd be happy. Thank to you give very you my much. Copy. Oh, you have it. I do. Oh, Dolores has it. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak at this time, Mr. Colantonio? Good evening, Gascon Antonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. And before I start my, uh, my speech, which is not the first time, I have to apologize with the people that have already heard it before, but not uh, for the three new counselors. So I am here again for the stop sign, and I will not go away. Ah, let me start. The town manager, as stated before, that is against the law to install a stop sign on Morrison Avenue. I would like to have an explanation of why it's against the law. I've asked already more than once. I still, maybe I'm a foreigner. That's why I don't understand when people give me an answer, I guess, but so be it. I still do not have an answer why. So let me quote again the police reported in 2009. 2009, it's around the corner, it's 2018. It's, it's many years. Quote, stop signs should not be used for speed control. I agree. Stop signs should be installed in a manner that minimizes the number of vehicles having to stop. 
Once the decision has been made to install two-way stop control, the decision regarding appropriate street to stop should be based on an engineering judgment. In most cases, the street carrying the lowest volume of traffic should be stopped. True. A stop shot should not be installed on the major street unless justified by a traffic engineering study. It's also true. The very reason that the citizen states, the citizen, it's me, states we need a stop sign, there is the very reason a stop sign should not be added there. Again, it's on Morrison Avenue and Orchard, or Tifton. That's the end of quote. Let me say that I agree with all the points and I believe that the stop sign at Hillcrest Avenue are not needed, nor required, but the stop sign is needed on Morrison Avenue because Tifton Road intersectional side distance is not adequate for the average speed on the street. I guess the town engineer is right here and someday I would like to have an answer about that. Now, with these statements, I'm not saying remove the stop sign on Hillcrest Avenue. I'm only bringing up Hillcrest Avenue because it's only a few hundred feet. Hillcrest Avenue is running parallel to Morrison Avenue, a few hundred feet away. Okay, so I'm not suggesting you remove the stop signs on Hillcrest Avenue. I'm only suggesting that we need a stop sign because of unsafe reasons. And let me ask, let me point out the reasons or let me compare the two streets. Morrison Avenue is 24 feet wide. Hillcrest Avenue is 30 feet. Morrison Avenue has a three foot grass strip. Hillcrest Avenue has a 15 foot grass strip. Morrison Avenue has an average daily traffic of 750 cars. Now keep in mind that Morrison Avenue was never meant to connect it to Silas Dean. Now it has 750 cars, which is twice as many as almost and Hillcrest Avenue, which they have 365. Now, these numbers, they come from the town. They are not numbers that I imagine myself. So whatever I'm saying, it's, it's from the town. The distance, be the, the distance between the front of the houses is less than 100 feet for Morrison Avenue. The distance for Hillcrest Avenue is 150 feet. Can you start picturing the way it is, one street versus the other? Orchard Street and Tifton Road connect to Morrison Avenue. Only Orchard Street connects to Hillcrest. The town has taken measurements for the intersectional side distance for Orchard at Hillcrest and found to be 344 feet to the east and 970 feet to the west. The town has also taken measurements for the intersectional side distance for Orchard Street and Morrison Avenue and found to be 290 feet 290 feet now, it's much less than 344. Tifton Road and Morrison Avenue, the distance is 232 feet, which is much less. Now, let me quote again the police report, which was dated in 2009. The stop sign for westbound traffic on Morrison Avenue at Orchard Street is necessary because of a sightline restriction when on Orchard Street I found that when driving south on Orchard Street, it is difficult to see westbound cars because of a fence of, at 6 Orchard Street. And the grade of the road on Morrison Avenue, just west of Orchard Street, is, is steeper. So this is the end of quote. What they're saying is that, you know, that basically the stop sign in the westbound direction on, on Morrison Avenue is needed because you can see, you know, 232 feet. Okay, no, 290 90 feet. Now again, 290 feet distance requires a stop sign and 232 feet going downhill does not require a stop sign. I come back. Okay, thank, thank you, you very Mr. Much. Uh, I'll come back, thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Mr. Rue? George A. Rue, <clears throat> George A. Rue, 956 Cloverdale Circle. Earlier in the evening when I got here a little early, Matt asked me, do you have any words of wisdom for us tonight? And I said, yeah, I'd be happy. I'm going to share a few of them with you tonight. 
I don't have any major complaints about what the town is doing or not doing. My pond is great. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I've come across something that is of real concern to me. You've heard me say in the past that all politics is local. And I say that again. And I'll preface it also with the concept that the, the, the minimum uh, representation law that's in effect in this town right now is good, and I'm glad it's that way. But, the but is, at the inauguration, a couple of points really caught my attention. One was yours, Amy, about not using fracking waste. And the other one had to do with the resistance. And I think the governor addressed that issue some time back, and I believe I addressed it one time back also, where he said, we don't have to cooperate with ICE and start arresting everybody in their uncle. And the other one was a point Mr. Spinella made. On the 30% of turnout on voters. And I didn't realize that because right these days, where I am age-wise, most of me works pretty well, but it's a little slower, okay? And I thought to myself, there's a strong message there. And I'm not too sure that this council has any idea maybe why it's 30%, why it's so poor. And I'll share it with what I think and what as best of the research that I can find and read about in that horrible rag, the New York Times, do I get time out when I can't flip my pages? <laughs> is uh, government at all levels, including the moron in Washington, the Congress, the local, the local elected officials, and starting to move down to the local, local levels, there's a lack of respect that the council seems to want from our residents. And yet, on the other hand, the respect that is due to the residents who are the employers of at least some of you here seems to be really lacking. And this has manifested itself, in my judgment, in this rule of arbitrary five minutes. Now, five minutes, you've got to have some rules. But there's a little bit of common sense that I believe has to be used by all of you. Paul Montaneri, for many years, presented a mature, reasonable approach to when people got a little bit carried away or had a little bit more to say. You cannot just arbitrarily say everybody's five minutes, they can't speak as fast as me. Some people that come here, you intimidate the daylights out of them. And I don't think that that's right. I think it's dead wrong. And if you want to do something, your job should be to encourage more people to come and vote and show a little bit of respect, even if you don't like what they have to say. Maybe you don't like what I have to say. I don't always agree with my friend Bob or some of the other public speakers here, but they have a right to speak. And when you have two or three speakers as opposed to a, a room full to be that hard-nosed and not let people finish who may be scared, who may not be very adept at public speaking, who may have to read and are intimidated, which I don't intimidate easy, I think you have to give that a little thought as to the wisdom, the words of wisdom, to, uh, Matt, are use your brains, don't push that issue that hard. You've got to main, con maintain control. You know that, I know that. But when you have two or three speakers here, don't tell me five minutes or six minutes or seven minutes or even as much as the Montaneri let me go for 18 minutes is going to change the world. We in this town put up with inane dis, uh, presentations like I happened to see on TV, that health, that health issue that was presented the other night. Every single week or twice a month at the Board of Education meetings, they waste an hour on self-congratulatory time that they keep the citizens waiting and waiting and waiting. All right, so I vented my anger, I vented my thoughts, I've shared my wisdom, and I'll tell you one thing, as an XGI, this is not what I spent and put my life on the line for as a young man. And that only came to me as I got a little older and realized, you started to realize that hey, that was a very dangerous game we played. And when I see and when I sense that this has to be this arbitrary rule, 
where you start to argue with the citizenry because you don't like what they got to say, I don't think it's a smart thing to do. So I share it with all of you. I share it with all of you. I could go on for another 20 minutes. I probably went over my five minutes already. And that's not an unwise thing to do. Okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Rue. Do we have anybody else in the public who'd like to speak? Mr. Mazzarella? Uh, good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walker Hill Road. <clears throat> I'm going to give you the short version of Mr. Rue and his uh, comments on public speaking. <clears throat> so I had uh, conversations with uh, former Mayor Montaneri last year sometime. And I felt uh, some of the public speaking was getting out of hand. It was just excessive. And I was afraid that at some point uh, the rules would be strictly enforced and clamped down. And that appears to be what happened last uh, town council meeting. <clears throat> so I looked at the town code, uh, specifically what it says regarding the public uh, comment section. And uh, each speaker is limited to five minutes. And uh, the time restriction can be enforced by a timing device. If a speaker exceeds the limitation, the chair shall notify the speaker and allow 30 minutes for or 30 seconds for summation. Um, I think when I hit my five minutes, I was told I was done. Uh, so I ask that in the future we could at least get a little heads up. It's uh, it's not easy coming up here and shooting from the hip. Uh, it's hard to judge exactly how long it's going to take. And it's an unfortunate situation where it's not a conversation. It's a one-way uh, delivery, a speech, if you will. And I sometimes rely on body language. I can watch Jeff and see when he pushes back in his chair because Mazzarella doesn't have it right again. Um, it's unfortunate that we couldn't you know, have more of a dialogue situation. But it is what it is. But it also goes on to say that the chair at his or her discretion may grant the speaker additional time. And at the last meeting, there was a nice woman that came up, uh, Mary Dobrek of Follybrook, and she had great things to say about Weathersfield, and she was thanking everybody up here, and everything was, you know, perfect, right up until the point where she said she was moving out of town. Uh, but she was allowed to go over the five-minute period. She went six minutes. and. Uh, I just think that if you're going to enforce the rule, then everybody should get exactly five minutes. Be notified. Wrap it up, please. Go. I'd also say it wouldn't hurt if we could get some kind of timer here, a little five-minute hourglass or something, and uh, we'd know where we stood as far as uh, time period. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak? Ms. White? Hello, Casey White, 91 Center Street. Um, I just want to speak in favor generally of um, the proposed fracking waste ban, which I believe is um, still being discussed. Um, but I just want to say that I think having a robust uh, fracking waste ban is a smart thing for the town. And it um, is a trend that is a good trend in Connecticut that we'd be joining other communities with. So I'm in favor of that. And I also just want to um, thank all of you in advance for working on, I know there are new cuts probably in the school budget, and I know that's um, not easy work. So thank you all for working on that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comment? Mr. Karuk? <clears throat> Uh, good evening, David Kirk, 149 Broad Street. Um, I, I just want to make a little comment about the uh, the uh, time uh, limit of speaking, and uh, uh, I I don't agree with the other speakers. I I watched years ago uh, West Hartford uh, Town Council online, uh, and um, they give them three minutes, and I think they cut off the mic after three minutes. So if you're trying to talk, no one else would hear you. 
And what they'd have is cards. I don't know, I th uh, different colors. Uh, yellow is warning. That means you have, when they see a yellow card, that means you only have, I don't, I don't know, a minute or whatever. And then red means you got to stop. So, uh, and then if they don't stop, then they'll, the first they'll cut off the mic and they'll say something. But, um, but it's your discretion, as you know. And uh, I think uh, the past, uh, some of the other mayors are maybe too generous in, in, in allowing speakers to speak for, I've seen speakers speak for over 20 minutes, and that's, some of it is just really, just, they're on a soapbox, you know. And even, uh, here's another thing, West Hartford, you can't just come here and speak about anything you want. You have to speak about the specific issue that's, that, that, that they're talking about. And if you don't, they'll just cut you off. So I think uh, Westfield is very liberal in, 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 in how, uh, uh, how much they, latitude they give speakers to, to talk about anything they want and to and sometimes give them extra time. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the audience who would like to speak? Seeing none, we will move on uh, to council reports. Any councilors have reports? Still We're still waiting on, on someone from the MDC. No, wait, Scott's on his way. Okay. okay. Uh, moving on then to council comments. Any councilors have comments? Councilor Hurley? Um, I think just as the woman brought up that the town is looking at $922,000 reduction. And I think we need to start talking about how that will be allocated to the Board of, e Board of Ed in town. Um, if it is 60% Board of Ed, it would be over 500000 and 370 to the town. So I'm just wondering when we'll start discussing the reductions. Because the farther we get away, the harder it's going to be to reduce. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other comments? Nobody. Okay. Town manager's report. Thank you. I just want to briefly go over what we're talking about in this account uh, issue that Mr. Young has brought up, and I appreciate him bringing it up. Uh, for years, the town had um, cr helped these local groups create bank accounts to raise special revenues from fundraisers or um, user fees and be able to put those aside and mostly for the operations of those particular activities like the cheerleading team, like Mikey's Place, like men's softball. And over the years, those accounts have shrunk from about 14 down to four. So the four outstanding accounts we're talking about are for the Weathersfield Senior Club, which does bingo. So this Money from bingo goes into this account. Money from bingo goes out of this account to basically buy refreshments and pay the five or six or seven dollar winning bingo amounts that uh, happen weekly. The other one's men's softball, where men who want to play softball play pay a user fee. It goes into this account. The operations of the league for referees and equipment uh, come out of this account. And periodically, this group gives a large portion of money to the town for field improvements. Okay, so you have another one that's Mikey's Place, and we all wouldn't know what Mikey's Place is. It's a playground in Old Weathersfield that was uh, in memoriam. Uh, they have various fundraisers, and that money is used to maintain Mikey's Place. Um, so these, that's what these accounts are. And these accounts don't mix with general fund money. There's no ability for tax dollars to go into these accounts. There's no ability for the board of directors for any of these organizations to write checks on the town's accounts. It was a simple mechanism to allow these organizations to raise funds for specific purposes for the betterment not only of uh, the group that wants to play the game or have the Mikey's Place or whatever it is, but for the entire town. And many of these clubs have donated resources to enhance the town's facilities. So as we go forward, we'll continue to reduce the number of these outside accounts that use the tax ID number, but it doesn't commingle with town funds at all. 
at least in these four conditions, which are the four that the town has. So as uh, the mayor said, I responded to Mr. Young, or actually uh, Finance Director Michael O'Neill responded to Mr. Young at 2.06 p.m. this afternoon with that information. Um, this note goes back to 2010, and it will probably show up again in this audit report, but it's not material. It's not a deficiency. In the CPA terms, it doesn't represent a failure in the audit. Now, it is probably something we should resolve over time, and as I stated, we are down from 14 or more than 10 of these accounts down to four, and we'll continue to work with these groups to create the 501c3s necessary for them to get their own ID number, or they have to use some private banking account from one of their members. That was for convenience sake that we allowed them to use the town's number. That way they could raise the funds, enhance the community, and operate their organization expeditiously. Thank That's you. That's all I have, Thank you. Uh, town Clerk, do you have anything? Do I have, can I ask a question of that? Sure. Um, is there oversight of these accounts we other get, than Bloom Shapiro? Yes, uh, Parks and Recs gets a monthly report, monthly bank statement from them, from each group every month. So we know if money's going in, some of these are savings accounts, so I would imagine we get an interest. Yeah, we get the, re we get the statements for all the accounts. And we also get money, uh, <coughs> notification of any money taken out. Yes. Okay. Um, the Mikey's placed $201,000 mm -hmm. savings account. Saving for replacement playground components. Yes. So if the cushion mats underneath the swings or part of the jungle gyms, anything like that mm -hmm. fails, breaks down, we don't have warranty on that anymore, right. this would go towards that? Yes, replacing the spring toys, replacing the slides, whatever it is. And the group that manages Mikey's Place goes through a process and works with Kathy on what's going to be replaced. Okay. And then the money of the $200,000, is that it was that an initial grant at some point and it just stayed in there or was that town funds at one well, they, point? They hold numerous fundraisers each year and that money is used and accumulated over the over time. Well, I mean, your explanation and and looking at dropping it from 14 down to 4 and the oversight by not only the the <coughs> town but by Bloom Shapiro, I think uh I mean, I think the town's doing a pretty good job keeping track of uh, money going in and coming out. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there any other questions? <clears throat> okay. The town clerk, do you have anything to report? Yeah, uh, this Friday, the senior center is going to have open house, and they have a lot of events going on between 10 and 1. And we have fishing licenses for 2018 for anybody who wants to buy uh, Christmas presents. Thank you. Are we ready for the MDC presentation? I think, is the chairman coming or? Uh, yeah, we, I'm, I'm Scott Chelson, I'm the CEO, and we just had our uh, board meeting, so uh, our chairman is, is coming. Uh, we're just closing up our meeting, but uh, I just want to introduce myself. I have staff here that's going to do the presentation, and I'll be here to answer any questions you might have. My name is Scott Chelson, I'm the CEO. I've been with the MDC for about 12 years. I ran the operational departments for eight, and I've been the CEO for the last number of years. So we have Rob Constable, who's our director of finance, who's going to do part of the presentation. Joe LaLiberty uh, is, uh, is uh, a consultant that works for CDM Smith. They're an engineering consultant that we have hired, and they are program managers for the Clean Water Project. So Joe's going to start off with this presentation. Rob will follow with uh, the important part of this presentation is really to talk about a very specific component of the Clean Water Project and about the budget. And what we're proposing to do in, with DEEP is we're proposing to change the way in which we're doing the Clean Water Project so that we can address affordability for our towns and our water rate uh, payers and also deal with you know, spending the money uh, in the right places within the MDC system. So that's the, really the important component. We call this integrated planning. EPA has, um, has, has approved integrated planning, uh, and it's a way in which you not only look at, when you think about the Clean Water Project, you simply think about 
uh, the products that we're doing here in Weathersfield right now, that's truly building capacity. And it's building capacity in a very quick time frame so that you can do a specific task, which is to pick up what we call a CSO, a combined sewer overflow, or an SSO, which is a sanitary sewer overflow. So it's a very uh, specific task to achieve a very specific goal mandated by the regulators. What we're proposing in integrated planning is to say that although we agree with, with the goals, uh, instead of trying to comply with those goals by building excess capacity, eating up your debt service, eating up your bonding capacity to build excess capacity, we're proposing to basically improve the existing 1,200 or 1,300 miles of sewer system over a much longer period of time, and therefore you'll kill two birds with one stone. It'll take you longer, but we'll be spending the money um, that we have available, affordability, on the infrastructure in the streets of our eight member towns. So I'm gonna let Joe explain uh, his piece, Rob will do his piece as it relates to the budget and how it impacts the towns, our eight member towns, and then we'll be more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you for having us uh, tonight. Uh, as Scott mentioned, my name is Joe LaLiberty. I'm with CDM Smith, Consultant Engineer and Program Manager for the uh, Clean Water Project for the uh, Hartford MDC. Um, we've been doing this to each of the member towns. I think this is the fifth one so far. Um, so hopefully we're getting it better each time as we go. So um, basically what I'm here to present is on the Clean Water Project. And in the city of Hartford, there is one pipe that conveys both stormwater and sewer. And when it rains, that pipe exceeds the, its capacity and it results in overflows that go to receiving water bodies that are referred to as combined sewer overflows or CSOs. In the towns outside of Hartford, the, eight, the seven towns out, member towns outside of Hartford, there's separated sewer and drainage systems. So there's a separate pipe that is collecting drainage and there's a, there's a separate pipe that's collecting the sewer from the houses. In those cases, similar scenario, when it rains, it still has excess, the, it, ex, it exceeds the capacity of the existing system and it results in sanitary sewer overflows. And what the Clean Water Project is, is the MDC's response to addressing both of those issues. There's a consent decree with the EPA for the SSOs and there's a consent order with DEEP for the CSOs in Hartford. In 2005, we had submitted the original long-term control plan. This is the plan that basically lays out how we will address this problem over the next several years. And it was approved by DEEP in 2007. This plan is required to be updated every five years. So in 2012, we updated the plan. It had some changes, a little bit less separation, a little bit more tunnel storage. Uh, the salt tunnel volume, as you know, uh, got bigger to address the Weathersfield Cove CSO, uh, CSOs. And it was approved by DEEP in 2014. What I'm here today to talk about is the next long-term control plan update, which is due at, this, at the end of December in 2018. So one of the major changes that occurred between the original plan being submitted and today is the EPA came out with new guidance in 2012, around the time that we were submitting the last update, that allowed for municipalities and communities to submit an integrated plan, which is what Scott was just uh, talking about. Basically, through the Conference of Mayors, municipalities banded together and went to EPA and said, you're hitting me with all of these different orders. You're telling me I need to do this for my sewer system. I need to do this for my treatment plan. I, you're telling me I have to do, address MS4s for the stormwater permit. And you're not allowing me to understand them all in <coughs> one combined plan that looks at which project is actually the most important to do now versus which one should be delayed. And so, with our next plan that we're going to submit to DEP is going to be an integrated plan. It's basically going to take these various components that previously were, previously were looked at in silos and look at them all together to figure out which is the most important project to do. All of these can be considered on the umbrella of the affordability analysis, which I'll get to in a little bit later. So basically, if you think of these silos or buckets, 
we have all of these various projects that need to be implemented. And on the road that we were on, only the CSO long-term control plan, which you see in the top left bucket, is what was currently being envisioned under, the, under what we were, had to do for, for DEP to address CSOs. The CSO long-term control plan as it relates to Weathersfield would be the South Tunnel and the sewer separation projects that were done in the Franklin Ave area that is addressing the combined sewer overflows that goes to Weathersfield Cove. Similarly, we have an SSO master plan. That is the master plan that deals with all of the seven communities that are outside of Hartford. There is, so there's additional funding that's needed there. Projects within that bucket that would relate to Weathersfield would be the uh, Goff Brook Overflow Project that's under construction now, Randy Lane, which was uh, completed construction in 2013. Significant amount of sewer lining that we've done to date. We've actually rehabilitated about a third of the sewers in the town of Weathersfield and other projects uh, throughout the system. General collection uh, sewer system is basically what we need to do in order to spend on, you know, between the eight towns in order to keep the sewer system running on a year-to-year -year basis without it falling apart. Pump stations, I believe there's 78 sewer pump stations in the MDC's uh, system, several of them that are in Weathersfield as well. So again, these pump stations, they typically have about a 20-year life. So if you're looking out a long period of time, they need to have money that's spent on them in order to keep them running. CMOM stands for Capacity, Management, Operation, and Maintenance. Under the, sanita under the SSO consent decree with the EPA, there was a requirement for the MDC to, t to televise inspect all of their sewers, locate and televise inspect all of their sewers. So in the process of doing that, they have, they have televised pipes that they hadn't previously, and they're finding lots of problems, or they're finding sewers that they're having trouble to access that are, per that are in cross-country areas. And what this has resulted in is an enormous amount of projects that need to be completed in order to just keep the sewer system running. We're finding breaks in the sewer mains. We're finding uh, you know, leaky sewers uh, that all need to be addressed. Stormwater and flood control, I had met with, uh, with with people from Weathersfield to try to go over what you guys are going to be spending on the MS4 stormwater permit, because that also can be included in this affordability analysis. The flood control system would relate more to Hartford and East Hartford. Wastewater treatment plants, half of your flow goes to the Hartford plant, and about the other half of the flow, or maybe a little bit more, goes to the Rocky Hill plants. You actually have flow that goes to the two largest wastewater treatment plants. And those two have had, we've spent over $500 million in upgrades at those two plants, and there'll continue to be work that needs to be done at the, at the wastewater plants. Uh, institution organizational is uh, pretty self-explanatory. It's more related to staffing. And then, of course, you know, I only have one bucket here, but there is the drinking water system, which has its whole set of components between the, between the treatment plant and the distribution system. So basically, all of these summed up to roughly $2.5 billion over 12 years. Clearly, there's no way that, that we can afford that type of work in the next 12 years. And so what we're looking to do is to go to an integrated plan. So the first thing we have to look at is how will we address the combined sewer overflows in the city of Hartford. That's what DEP is going to be interested in seeing. What you are looking at with the figure on the right-hand side of the map, the green bars are the total volume of combined sewer overflows, and the red bars that they sit on top is the number of overflows that happen per year. So what you'd want to draw your eye to is the skyscrapers in downtown that shows that the majority of the CSOs, both on frequency and volume of discharge, are in the downtown area. So we'll be spending a lot of time trying to figure out exactly how we're going to address those CSOs in the downtown area. Whereas when you look at, say, northern Hartford, there's a lot, the, the bars are a lot smaller for the volume of discharge and the frequency. So they're, 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 uh, they're contributing less than, than, nor than central Hartford. And then in southern Hartford, we're addressing those combined sewer overflows through the South Tunnel Project. So we'll look at a myriad of, of, of Combined sewer, overflow, uh, alternative analysis, sewer separation, tunnel storage, additional treatment plant capacity. These are all standard with EPA and DEP for every long-term control plan update. So we basically do is we take all of those other buckets that I talked about, and we take the long-term control plan, and we put it into the integrated plan uh, blender. And we look at ways to prioritize which projects should we do be doing first, and which projects should we be doing, say, 10, 20, or 30 years out. Um, we'll probably be looking at developing a 40-year 
uh, plan. So we'd be looking out over the next 40 years of what we'd be doing for all of these buckets. So we'll be looking at things like capital costs, operation and maintenance, which projects will actually help with operation and maintenance, and all of these water quality uh, impacts and, and flexibility and whatnot. All these things will be looked at as to how we determine which projects would be done in year one versus which projects may be done in year 30. Switching gears a little bit, this is looking more strictly at the uh, the capital improvement plan that we had done back in 2014. We'll be, uh, we'll be updating that in, uh, later on in 2018, but basically what this was showing is we looked at in 2014 varying levels of capital <laughs> expenditure spending on the sewer system. And then we looked at it out over time. And what we found was that the cost of doing nothing, so if we did no projects on the sewer system versus if we did, say, 10 or 20 or $40 million on the sewer system, the total cost to the resident was not that much different. The reason being is if I did nothing, I've got a 100 to 150-year-old sewer system, my operation and maintenance is going to increase if I did nothing. So they would just continue to break. We just had a major break on Homestead Avenue in, in Hartford that cost close to a million dollars to repair. Whereas if you do projects proactively, you'll avoid those failures, which costs a heck of a lot more to repair than it would if you did it proactively. So basically we were looking at trying to find the, the happy medium between how much do we spend on CIP that makes sense versus the fact that you just can't ignore your sewer system. And at the time we wound up landing on 35 million for CIP. So all of these things, and again, this, this graphic also dates back to 2014. We're in the process of updating everything. We'll be updating this in 2018 prior to submitting our, our revised plan. When we had looked at this back in 2018, uh, basically the EPA says that what is considered affordable to the rate payers is 2% of the median household income. And so back in 2014, we had forecasted out where we were headed, given all of the expenditures that we, you know, with the cell tunnel, the treatment plant, all of the other things that we're doing. We actually, for the city of Hartford, we're going to cross this 2% threshold barrier, which is very important and it's something where we're, we're, we should be trying not to do, but constantly the EPA and DEP is trying to force you to do more faster. And that's what this results in. So what we'll be looking at with our 2018 plan is a way to try to smooth out that curve going down and try to make it so we can stay below the 2%, uh, not only for the member towns altogether or each individual town, but specifically for the city of Hartford. This is my last slide before I turn it over to Rob. And uh, basically what this is, is this is looking at, uh, when you look at from 2017 to the left, it's what we actually spent on CIP and the Clean Water Project. So you see the bigger bars are where, where the treatment plant and the salt tunnel are starting to come into play. What you're looking at when you look at 2017 to the right, you see the gray shaded area, and that's what we would have spent if we continued on the current path of the long-term control plan as it is currently approved by DEP, which was for us to complete all projects by 2029. If you look at 2017 to the right and ignore the gray, and you look at the green bars, that's more what we're looking at for doing with this integrated plan. We're basically looking at a dollar value, which right now where we're showing it is, I believe, $40 million, but a dollar value of an average dollar per year where projects will be prioritized based on need and, and where it makes the most sense, and basically shifting the work that needs to be done in downtown Hartford out about 20 years. And that's where you see the, the four or five bars that are up in 2038 to around 2042. That would be the construction of what we would need to do in the downtown Hartford area. The reason for shifting it where we did shift it is because all of the 20-year loans for the, for the treatment plant and the cell tunnel that we are, we are doing right now will be maturing and we would have paid them off so that this, the point of putting this in where it is would be new loans coming on as those loans are coming off. And at this point, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Rob. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Rob Constable. I'm Director of Finance at the MDC. And um, just to give you a quick update um, on the budget process. Right, we did meet today on the board. Uh, the board did adopt our budget. Um, we do have, just so the, the council knows, we do have 
meetings with the member towns. Um, we have two or three meetings a year, um, typically starting in August, September. Um, they, we've had up to, I believe, five meetings um, prior to the, adopting the budget. We do get involved, involved with the towns and hear their feedback. Um, so what you see in front of you is the timeline for this year. And as I said, we did uh, adopt our budget this evening. Um, this is slightly different than what was adopted, but the bottom line is in total there's been some adjustments. So, um, but the important thing about this slide and going back to what Joe had just presented is you can see our two largest items on our, on our budget are payroll related and debt service. Um, the payroll related includes you know, the pension, OPEB, um, headcount, COLAs, and so on. At MDC from 2007, we had uh, approximately 604 um, positions. We are, um, 2018, we'll have 489. So we continue to reduce staffing to try to help mitigate um, costs, and we continue to look at ways to do more with less. Um, currently, we're going through a, a re-implementation of our SAP system to try to continue to streamline our business processes, particularly on the finance side, um, as well as the operational side. The debt service is important to note only because, as uh, has been mentioned here, the integrated plan, the way this would work, currently any capital improvement um, expenditures that are outside the clean water project are, for sewer are paid through the sewer operations, and the primary funding for that would be the town ad valorem. Um, on the water side, the water capital projects would be paid through the water rates. By going through an integrated plan, the objective here is to say, okay, all these projects that Joe showed you on those buckets, we want to incorporate that into the clean water project program. And what that means is that down the road, um, when we look at debt service for that, that's impacting the ad valorem, the, the debt service as we know it today would freeze because we weren't issuing any new debt. Um, theoretically against the ad valorem, all that money would be paid for by the clean water project uh, charge, which you see on your, your water bill. Um, and that rate was projected to be less than $5. So even as we push this out, as you saw in Joe's um, graph, we're pushing it out for another 20, 30 years. The objective is to keep it below what we originally projected for that clean water project charge. So that would stay down below that $5 charge. It would just last longer. <coughs> but on the flip side, there would be no debt service that would go into the operating budget for that would impact the ad valorem or the sewer user charges. Um, so that, you can see it's a significant amount of um, expenditures on the budget. This year, um, between 2017 and 2018, our debt service alone went up by $5.8 million on sewer and about $2.1 million on water. Um, the MDC is uh, significantly, uh, has a significant amount of infrastructure that we have to maintain. As you heard, you know, some of our infrastructure, infrastructure is 100 to 150 years old. Um, you realize that on a cold January night when we have water main breaks, our guards are out there, no matter what the temperature is trying to replace these pipes. Um, a couple of years ago when it was really cold, we had in excess of 240 breaks in, in a matter of two and a half months. Um, and so that's a huge expense to do it when it's broken versus trying to be proactive and planning for it. So the goal here is not only on the water side, but also on the sewer side is to try to be more proactive and try, but we have to manage it, as Joe mentioned. We, it has to be afford, affordable to our customers in our towns. Um, we can't spend uh, $2.5 billion in the next 12 years, so that's really why we're trying to go to this integrated plan. How can we s spread this out, still meet our objectives, still maintain um, the pipes and our service, but minimize the rate impact over that period of time? So on the water revenues, um, as you may have heard, our water rate, we have um, two components basically on a water rate. We have a, a variable rate, which is based on the amount of water you use. So currently it's at $2.77 per CCF. CCF is about 748 gallons. Um, that rate is going up to $3.14. Um, that's about a 13% increase on the variable rate. And why is that going up so high? Um, currently um, for the 2017 budget, we projected to sell about 20 million CCFs. Currently, we're on pace to do less than 19. We're closer to 18 million CCFs. So for every million CCFs that were below budget, that's a loss of about $2.7 million. So in the event that we, we come in at around 18 million uh, CCFs for the sale of water in 2017, we're going to have about a $5.5 million deficit this year on our water uh, fund. On the sewer side, we're projecting about, about a million, a million and a half dollar deficit. So currently, in order to... to um, impact what we did for the budget assumptions. We're assuming we're only going to sell 18.4 million CCFs in 20, 
uh, 18 down from the 20 that we rejected. That's about uh, 24 cents of that increase. And the other increase is related to debt service because that is a significant increase on debt service. On the customer service charge, which is the $14 and change, that will remain unchanged. So we're not changing the fixed portion. Um, it will only be on the variable piece that we're changing. So when you take the net effect of those two charges, the overall rate is only going up about um, 8%, uh, which equates to, I believe, about um, $9 a month for an average consumer. The general fund, um, this is the sewer. So currently what's in the budget, we have a 8% increase on the ad valorem. So you can see that it's going from um, 41.6 million up to 45 million. Again, the major drivers here are debt service. And the other big component that we have currently is um, uh, we have a contingency of about $2.5 million. Um, Starting in August of 2016, we, we started billing the state of Connecticut for material that was coming out of the Hartford landfill into our sewer system. Um, so there, when we started billing that, currently they were billing them at the sewer user rate, which is about $3.06 um, <coughs> per CCF. They're getting billed about 10 cents a gallon. So their bill went up significantly um, to the point where we met with the state. They said they were unwilling to pay it. It wasn't budgeted. Um, currently, they owe us about $3.5 million, um, which they haven't, they paid only a small portion of what we've been billing them. That has been turned over to uh, collections. Um, and we've met with the state and we continue to meet with the state to try to resolve this. We've reached out to the member towns to help support that. But in the 2018 budget, we have a contingency to offset that revenue. We're still anticipate, we're continuing to bill them. Um, there's about $2.5 million in revenue that we anticipate, but we also have a contingency against that revenue. So therefore, um, it, it's really net impact zero to the budget other than the towns ultimately that's feeding into ad valorem. In the event that contingency was not there and all, everything else being equal, instead of being an 8% increase, that would only be about a 2.5% increase. Um, but the objective here is to work with the state and figure out how we're going to um, get, get them to pay for this um, because they are putting um, contaminated materials into our sewer system. So that's, those two are, line items are driving the significant increase in uh, the ad valorem side. So going back to the debt, so what you see on the chart here is everything in the black is our existing debt. Um, the light tan color, uh, we issued a, uh, a ban, a short-term note this August for $120 million. Next August, I'm going to have to convert that into a long-term permanent financing. Um, so based upon our estimates, the peach or tan area there will also be part of the um, operating budget going forward. So you can see there's a significant increase on the um, operating budget for 2019 because we're going to issue, continue issuing debt. Um, as we mentioned, we spend about $70 million plus dollars a year on um, infrastructure costs. Um, and we typically go to the market every other year, so we're issuing um, anywhere from 120 to 170 million dollars with the bonds um, pretty much every other year. So it's pretty significant impact. Um, as you're aware, with the, the rating agencies, we have a, a rating coming up, a surveillance call with the rating agencies in January, um, in light of the fact that the city of Hartford, the state of Connecticut, and we're having issues because, as I mentioned, we're going to have a deficit this year in both sewer and water. There's a good likelihood that we're going to get downgraded. Um, and it's like having bad credit. You get downgraded, your interest rate goes up. Uh, when we issued our ban, and, and uh, we had issued a ban in February of this year, uh, we believe that our downgrade that we had received cost us an additional $500,000 of interest um, for that short-term note. Um, so there's, it does impact um, the amount of money that we have to collect. So the worse our credit goes down and the ratings go down, the interest rate goes up. And um, as we mentioned, you know, this infrastructure has to be maintained and replaced. If we don't, those costs will still come through operations um, over time and so on, trying to fix it on the fly, which is far more expensive. So the goal here is to try to plan further, but also financially, you know, we need to look at how do we keep our house in order and try to mitigate some of the issues that are going on with the state or City Hartford and so on, so we can try to keep our bonds up. But so basically the black area and the peach area will be the existing debt going forward. And then... The uh, purple area would be any future issuances that we have that are not part of the integrated plan. So as you can see, this would continue to climb um, over the years, and that would impact ad valorem as well as the, um, 
this is probably this is all sewer, so this would all go against the ad valorem. And the yellow piece up there is just for combined. So if we do work on, say, headquarters, that's split between sewer and water. So those projects will still be there even if we go to an integrated plan. Um, so basically, if we didn't do or if we're successful in getting the implement integrated plan, excuse me, um, this is what the debt service would look like. So you can see we're going to lock in that black piece. We're going to lock in that tan peach color. And no, so over time, as those get paid off, come down the road, um, all we're going to have to do is have that small combined piece. But this would be a benefit to the operating budget because, again, it wouldn't go into the ad valorem. It would be part of the clean water project and paid for by the clean water project a surcharge. Um, and that's the objective here, and that's what we're looking to do. Um, as part of this integrated plan, because there's a benefit across the board for everyone. So this is just a quick um, overview. We mentioned it earlier. You can see debt service is a significant amount of, uh, and is climbing um, as we continue moving forward. The goal is to try to get that portion of the debt service out of the ad valorem and the operating budget and into the integrated plan. And you can see that our headcount is continuing. I mentioned it earlier, we went from 604 to next year we're dropping to 489. We're currently at 412. So again, we continually look at ways to reduce headcount and reduce cost. I mentioned this earlier, so you can see the 38 uh, cent increase on this um, water rate. 24 cents was associated with a decrease in consumption going from the 20 million down to 18.4 is what we're projecting next year. And then 12 cents related to uh, the debt service. So those are the big drivers. This gives you an overview of all the expenditures um, by category. Um, and so you can see, again, debt service and regular pay are a significant amount of the, of the operating budget that we, we deal with on an annual basis. So what does this mean um, for this other, just jumping back? So this is 2017, so you can see it's 30.65% regular pay, 16% debt service. For 2018, you can see the debt service jumped up to 33% since 2007. 2007. Yes. 2007 versus 2008. 2007, excuse me, 2018. So debt service is um, a very large uh, portion of our budget and continues to grow. And as you know, it's, once you have that debt service, you're stuck with that for 20 years until it's paid off. So just to give you an uh, idea of uh, other water companies around the region, you can see that for the MDC 2018 rates uh, for the annual uh, water cost is about $557, um, up from the 512. Um, if you look at the other water companies that surround uh, the MDC, you can see that we're still very uh, competitive and economical compared to other water companies. The union filled division is actually, they buy MDC water and they're restricted on how much they can charge for that. And so they benefit from our water, but they um, and get to sell at a lower part, uh, rate in that region. On the sewer side, uh, the question is always comes up is what is the cost in the average customer for sewer? As you know, um, the, the um, residents pay a tax because we charge the towns an ad valorem, which you then pass on to your residents. And so we went through and tried to come up with a, uh, on average by town, what that ad valorem impact would be on each resident. And again, you can compare that to uh, the time bound study. So we're, even on the sewer side, we're still very competitive uh, compared to other um, companies. So this slide um, is just off slightly because we got adopted another rate, but basically this would, rate would be for uh, 2018. So as I mentioned earlier, the water use charge is going from 277 to 314. The water customer service charge will remain at 14.98%. So just for the water portion, excluding clean water and some of the other regulatory issues that we'll bring up, um, if you just took those two line items, it's about 8.1% increase just on the water piece. The clean water project, as Joe mentioned, is mandated by a consent order and consent decree. We're mandated to separate the um, wastewater and eliminate overflows and so on. So that's uh, also being charged to our customers, but it's really a regulatory requirement. That rate is expected to go from 350 to 380. Um, not included in here is a new fee that was passed with the state budget um, that we have to charge for uh, $4 per customer per year um, to help fund DPH. Um, it's my understanding they lost some federal funding, so now they're asking the water companies to collect that money for them. So our customers will be seeing that next year on their bills, uh, starting in March or April timeframe. 
Uh, so there'd be a new charge as a pass-through. We're required to bill our customers, and basically we, um, January of 19, we have to turn around and, and, um, and pay um, DPH $200,000, and also in July of 19, we gotta pay them another $200,000. So the first year, it's approximately $400,000 that we have to collect. Um, so we're, the customers are gonna see that on our bill. So we're in the process of revamping our bill so we can separate, segregate their, the uh, feg state and reg uh, federal regulated rates versus what our costs are really are, so people can get a better understanding. Because again, some of this is required that we we charge customers. It's not just NDC um, going out and billing. It's, we're mandated to do these jobs. We're also like with the DPH, we're mandated to collect it and pass it back. So that's our presentation for this evening, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Bob, if you could yes. just leave this slide up. Yes. I'd just like to make uh, a few points on this. Uh, one of our uh, biggest uh, concerns from our customers has been, if you look at, uh, I can't see from here, so I'm gonna, if you look at 2018 billing uh, of member towns, you see there's 314, 179, and $380. So um, the $380 is not, has nothing to do with water. It's only the way in which we pay for the debt service on the Clean Water Project, and that was decided back in 2006 about how do we actually pay for the clean water program. And the agreement was with the towns uh, uh, that uh, it was better to address this. Uh, and the fairest way to pay for it was to pay for it through the consumption of your water bill. So instead of it being applied to ad valorem, it was to be applied to the water rate. So as people start to see their water bill, not their water rate, but their water bill double, in the last uh, few years, that $380 is, is the clean water surcharge. Um, and that has had a reverse effect on water consumption because it's based on how much water you consume. People have been, been using less water. Across the country, uh, it's, it's documented that the, that the water consumption has been dropping across all water utilities anywhere from one to 2% a year. And that has a lot to do with uh, just natural conservation, uh, has to do with uh, improvement in, in products of uh, washing and dryers and all those good things mandated by EPA. Um, but, but it has now, this, because this sewer surcharge has really, it's almost the identical price of what your water cost is, people are now conserving. And as Rob mentioned, it's very difficult to predict the impact of that special sewer service charge on our prediction of what water will be consumed. Um, where do you have the arrows here to go to the next slides? Here. So, so um, th that $380 that's on that bill, that, this is what's being paid for. So this is long history uh, of, the, of the MDC and EPA in the state of Connecticut. Back in 2004, there was a big debate uh, uh, regarding the Weathersfield Cove and regarding the north branch of the Park River is what is our improvements, what is it supposed to do? What, what do we have to achieve? And we have uh, 58 CSOs within the city of Hartford. So these are locations where when the sewer doesn't have enough, sewer pipe doesn't have enough capacity, we have a permit uh, that we can, we have to maintain the, uh, the water and the sewer within the pipe up to a one-year level of control, which basically means that one, it's an average uh, storm that occurs one time a year. So as long as we do that, we're in compliance, um, except for we had to eliminate the overflows in the North Branch, I'm sorry, yes, the North Branch of the Park River, and we also had to eliminate the overflows to the Weathersfield Cove. So uh, go back to 2012, uh, as, as uh, Joe mentioned, there's a, it took us about two years to get the plan approved from 2012 to 2014. The argument was over the definition of elimination. In 2004, in all the documentation that we presented, we defined elimination as to a design storm of an 18-year storm. So instead of a one-year storm, an 18-year storm, and that dictated the size of the, of, the, of the system and how much we had to separate and all those good things. Um, Deep said no. We, we, we meant elimination. So we got into that debate over what is elimination. And their interpretation was elimination is elimination, not an 18-year storm independent of what was agreed to in 2004. 
So what this shows is um, in order to achieve elimination, uh, we had to improve the size of the, of the infrastructure that's planned, the south tunnel, which is at the bottom, the brown, the north tunnel, which is the blue, which is where we're proposing not to build that as part of the integrated plan. And that increase cost the project about $160 million. So that's where that $380 in part is going to. Um, in addition, uh, this slide here, which I can't see, the, can't see the bottom of it, but I know what it looks like. Um, that is basically referring specifically to the Wethersfield Cove, and that's approximately the upsizing of that tunnel uh, and all the other things that we had to do to eliminate the overflows, which are mainly in the Franklin Avenue area, represents about $100 million. Um, the, um, the projects that have been done, not just in Wethersfield, but in all of our towns, if you look at just these numbers and what we have spent in Wethersfield, if you can imagine coming to, to this council and trying to get the Avalorum increased to pay as you go, it would, have been, it, it would have been impossible for the towns to be able to afford that. So that's why it was imposed as based on water consumption over a long period of time, but even that, uh, plan that cash flow model is becoming unaffordable to all of our eight member towns. So that's where we're trying to hold and we're trying to get the state of Connecticut to agree that we did what we did with the north, with the south tunnel, the brown, the brown line, but we're proposing to do something significantly different in the northern part of the city of Hartford. Um, and uh, this is just uh, just some examples. Um, when I first got here in 2006, um, I was constantly uh, dealing with a fair lane drive. <laughs> and, right? and there was a gentleman and uh, a couple, and I believe their names were Simonetta. I don't know if they still live there. Uh, but this neighborhood was covered with toilet paper and sewer every time we had a, a storm. Every time. Almost everybody on Fairlane Drive had, a, had a, uh, 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 a, a pump in their basement so they could pump the sewer into the, into the pipe so it didn't back up into their home, but really what that did was it just pumped it into the street or into someone else's basement that didn't have an injection pump. And what we realized was uh, we were planning to do an improvement to uh, Meadowgate Siphon. And that wasn't planned until today. The project that we're doing right now is, was part of that plan and what we realized was, uh, you know, 10 years away is too late. If, if Fairlane Drive isn't the poster child of the Clean Water Project, no, no project is. So what we decided to do was we, uh, we took the project in 2008, we started planning, and we designed in 2010 and actually completed and finished the project, we called it Randy Lane because the, way, the, the direction in which the sewer went was really through Randy Lane, uh, which is about 30 feet deep in rock. And, but that was to mitigate the impacts to Fair Lane and the surrounding areas. Um, that's what that $380 is for. Um, and then this is just another example, uh, which is the project that's going on now. If everyone understands um, uh, the wooden tap, I've been in the wooden tap numerous times with sewer three inches deep in the wooden tap. And it was whatever it was before the wooden tap. But, but that area is so flat that the sewer system is not, doesn't have enough capacity to capture and store it. It's like, being, it's like building a bigger highway, right? And so this project that is going on right now is to build that excess capacity and this golf court closure is one of those, we had eight, we have 58 CSOs in Hartford. We had eight SSOs that we had to close. Golf Brook was one of them, and that was mandated by a certain date. You gotta get it done. Um, could we have done uh, and solved this problem um, uh, of the Wethersfield Cove, of, of uh, the, the wooden tap over a longer period of time? Probably, but as most people lived Fairlane Drive and live uh, having the wooden tap call me at Saturday night uh, 
uh, at 10 o'clock because they had to close because of, a, because of an overflow. Um, those are things that we know we need to do and we've got to do it quickly. And there is no answer to it except get it done. And that's what the $380 is for. And these are just some of the examples in Weathersfield and there's multiple examples in, in elsewhere, in Hartford and, and West Hartford and others. But, but that's what that money is for. And uh, uh, we're mandated to do it. We have no choice. Um, I have sent, um, uh, we, the MDC, are a member of NACWA. It's the National Organization of uh, Clean Water Agencies and it's like a national um, industry uh, group that supports the wastewater municipalities. Uh, I sit as a member on their board representing Region 1, which is uh, out of Boston. There's, there's nine regions across the country. We have been meeting with uh, our delegation in Washington. We have been meeting with, we actually met with the, the new administration. <laughs> Um, we are uh, meeting with the EPA. We're trying to get the state of Connecticut, which is a delegated state. And what that means is uh, the EPA says to a state, if you, are, uh, if you have the capacity to implement our regulations, EPA's regulations, we will delegate the authority to you. And therefore they have, and they've done that to the state of Connecticut. The problem with that is that in a blue state, which Connecticut is, typically the delegated state be gets even more aggressive than EPA standards. MS4 is a perfect example. Um, the, the challenge uh, that we have is we're trying to get um, D EPA, as part of the presentation we show this, EPA agrees with integrated planning. They've approved it. Joe Liberty has, and CDM have actually worked on plans for Fall River, Massachusetts uh, in New Bedford. So it's happened, it's, it, it, they accept it. I have a letter from EPA that says they will accept it, but yet the state of Connecticut refuses to accept the concept with a, unless we submit on it. And our submission date is December of 18. So unfortunately we're going into this blind, we're hoping that DEEP will come to the table and they will agree sooner than later. And what that would do for us is that allows us to plan for our, um, our um, freezing of debt service, which is part of your of your um, of your Avalorum, uh, Rob and, and Joe mentioned that we we believe that we need to spend at least thirty five million dollars a year on the general sewer system, which is not clean water related. We're spending a hundred million dollars a year, and we're averaging about one hundred and ten million dollars a year, which is that three hundred eighty dollars uh, per year. We're spending one hundred and ten million dollars average plus the thirty five. We're proposing to merge those together and spend 40 over a much longer period. And that's our plan. Uh, if we get approval from DEEP sooner than later, we can start planning for freezing that debt service component increase of your Avalorum. And as Rob showed those pie charts, right now we're at 36%. If we can freeze $35 million a year in improvements represents about $2.5 million of debt service. It also, as Joe mentioned, it represents about two and a half million dollars of, um, of maintenance uh, that you would have to pay. So the challenge, I'm gonna go back to some of Joe's slides. The challenge that we have is if you spend $35 million in operations um, and you don't spend it on the infrastructure, you're eventually gonna have to spend it on infrastructure. So you're, you're gonna wind up paying twice. Um, just looking for Joe's chart here. The two lines represent the same in terms of dollars, but it represents something very different in what we're gonna spend the money on. The first, the highest uh, uh, bar, which I think is black, um, that shows over the life of the Clean Water Project, we will spend about $4.3 billion. But it's building capacity. It's building tunnels. It's building the Gulf Brook uh, plant, uh, I'm sorry, uh, pipe that we're building right now. So it's building you capacity, but the Gulf Brook project that we're doing right now costs us about $30 million. If you took $30 million and you did, uh, we did a lot of um, lining of, of, of pipes on private property and, um, and uh, in the streets to get the stormwater out. Um, so if you get the stormwater out, you don't have the big larger capacity. 
So that's our, uh, that's our logic. Let's spend the money on improving the existing infrastructure that's there, because as we know, we're, we're, sp we're selling less and less water, and the sewer is produced by how much water you consume, right? In general, 90% of it is whatever you consume in water is what you're discharging to the sewer. So uh, if we're consuming less water, why aren't we consuming less sewer? And we are, but it's the stormwater that's the problem. So let's get the stormwater out. It takes a longer time. It takes a longer period of time to get the stormwater out. And unfortunately, DEEP and EPA refuse to give us municipalities that longer period of time, and that's what we're fighting so hard for. Um, so, so the top line represents $4 billion, but building capacity. The bottom line represents slowing down our process, stop spending the $110 million a year over the short term, and spend that money on improving the existing infrastructure that's in the ground today. That's the difference. Same amount of money, but we're spending it on two different things. Um, so with that, um, if you have any questions, uh, myself or our staff, our chairman, Bill DeBella, is here. Um, we'd be more than happy to, to uh, Bill, would you like to say anything? No? Thank you. I hope that uh, this presentation gives you some perspective on where we're going long term and short term. And I think probably the issue that is at hand right now is the question of what we did with our budget this evening. And we did adopt the budget. Um, there were two sides of this budget, water and, and sewer, the ad valorem. Uh, as you know, the ad valorem is proposed to go up 8%. Um, that 8% reflects, as Scott was talking, the DEEP discharge of the uh, discharging the into discharging into our pipe into our sewer pipe and it uh, results in a 2.5 million dollar shortfall because DEEP is not meeting its obligation to pay the MDC for treating the uh, what's discharged from the landfill and uh, as a result we have billed them they have not paid uh, that budget reflects a contingent payment of $2.5 million. That's contingent upon not being paid by DEEP. Uh, we are pursuing DEEP, and it's an issue that really evolved about uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago, where we realized that there was a discharge from the landfill, which had originally gone into the river at DEEP's direction, and then it was directed into our sewer, we found and discovered that, went in, we tested what was being discharged as groundwater. It was groundwater, but it's coming out of the landfill, and it has a different complexity than water. It has a large discharge amount of ammonia. Uh, ammonia is the result of uh, nitrates, but it discharging into our system, and there's presently 15 15 clients that we have that are forced to pay a, a charge to the MDC to treat this. And those are people that are being, are being charged that by us at the direction of the DEEP. But DEEP does not want to pay for the treatment of that facility, of that product as it goes into our, our sewer system. As a result, we're in discussions with DEEP. Uh, we have tested the existing standard that's set for discharge of ammonia into a, any system is, uh, for, I believe it's 40 parts per liter. 50 milligrams per liter. 50, 50 milligrams per liter. The discharge by DEEP out of the landfill is 229 milligrams a liter, significantly above the standard. Uh, it presents problems in overflow uh, as, it, as it travels through our system um, in terms of what it discharges. Uh, we feel very strongly that DEEP has got an obligation, um, and we are pursuing that through our, our legal people in terms of that. If that is paid and they meet that obligation, that reduces the 8% charge or 8% uh, 
increase down to 2.5. That's a significant number. And right now, I believe we figured, calculated at $3.5 million as the shortfall. So if DEEP meets the obligation, it would be a $2.5 million payment that would eliminate the contingency to the town by that revenue coming into the budget. There was a resolution passed this evening or an amendment that directs it that it be used specifically for the purpose of reducing the 5.25 of the 8% charge to those towns. So that's something that we've got to deal with. Very similar to the last year we had with respect to Hartford's inability to meet their obligation. Uh, we went to the General Assembly. Uh, we resolved that issue in the General Assembly. It wasn't a cost to the towns in the, in, in the, the total process. Um, so that we're going to need the support of the towns, the legislative delegation, and obviously, uh, hopefully, support from uh, DEEP and ultimately a, a, a solution to this one way or the other. They, according to state statute uh, and the Clean Water Act, they do not have the right to discharge into our sewer system without our approval. And our position is that uh, we are not going to provide that approval. Uh, some of the options, I'm sure they also realize they can't dump it into the river. Uh, one of the other alternatives would be that they'd have to truck it off the site and not put it in our sewer, obviously increasing dramatically whatever that cost is because they still have to bring it to a treatment facility and it'll cost them 13 cents a gallon to, to treat that. And obviously the closest location that a truck would take it would be to Hartford to our facility. So hopefully we resolve that issue and it would result in a, a change in what the actual cost will be. We have six months before that actually hits the budget that we adopted tonight because we operate on two different um, fiscal years. Ours is a uh, calendar year, year with the legislative or governmental year that goes from June, uh, July 1st through June 30th. We're on July, January to June. So we don't, this would not, this charge doesn't hit until January through, through uh, uh, June 30th. Uh, the other side on the water, it's a simple equation. Uh, the less water we sell, the more expensive it becomes. We have, we're the only, only major water company in the state of Connecticut that does not use discounted rates to attract economic development, to attract additional people into our system, to grow the system and sell more water. It's something that we've been talking about for the last couple of years to all the towns and uh, one of the major issues that we dealt with over the last two years has been the Niagara issue. Niagara has come into our system and we sell, potentially will sell them 1.8 million gallons of water a year, I'm sorry, a day. Uh, that account, uh, when it's fully online and it comes online in about two and a half years by virtue of getting to four lines, I believe they're at what, two, two lines. going to three, that will, and then there's of course a tax agreement that they have with the town of Bloomfield that doesn't affect us. But when they get to their fourth line, it'll be a net revenue to the Metropolitan District Commission of $6 million a year. Uh, those are the kind of projects that provide us with additional water capacity or water uh, income. Um, and I think that uh, we've substantially proven the fact that in the most significant drought in the history of recorded time goes back to about 1913 when we started keeping track of what was happening in Connecticut. This was the worst drought that we've experienced. Uh, far worse than the 1965-66 drought and we still never went below 75 percent capacity in our reservoirs when everybody else in the state was under 25 and 30 and 15 and 18 percent. So we have more than enough capacity and uh, we have to sell more water, we sell more water, our rate goes down. It's a simple equation. Any questions? I'll be glad to address them. Councilors? Hi, Mr. DiBella. Thanks so much for the opportunity tonight. Um, curious to find out what your final vote was on your budget. Well, there was about 20 resolutions. Final bu budget vote, I believe there were three objections on some, two objections on other, 
four on at the most and one abstention. The rest, uh, the other 15 votes supported the <coughs> budget. Uh, there, th because of the way the budget gets mm -hmm. adopted, there's probably 20 different adoptions, meaning there's different issues. But the mo there, I believe there was four no's, the, the, uh, four, four no's was the most, but on average it would ran two to three people and one abstention. And when can folks start to see this increase in their bill? The increase in the bill is, like I say, this budget will impact January, January 1st. 1st. Yeah. Right. The impacts to the Avalorum, uh, uh, so you will, you, uh, from, from uh, uh, wrong, Jeff, but from, from January uh, to uh, uh, June, you are utilizing um, uh, last year's right. budget. It's right? last, so last year's. Last year's Avalorum, or, or 2017, and then from, um, we're six months behind. Six months behind you. So you're you're imposing. We're imposing a rate for January, but you won't you won't impose that change until July first. July first. Right? right. So there's six months to resolve the issue of DEEP. Hopefully, we can do it. Very similar to what happened in the Hartford situation, where we went to the legislature and resolved that issue. So it didn't have. You had a reserved. You had reserved money against that in the event that Hartford did not pay and couldn't pay. Uh, the legislature in its wisdom, governor proposed that in the event that Hartford or any community found itself in that situation where they couldn't meet their obligation, it would, it would be subtracted uh, from their uh, pilot payments and paid directly to the MDC. And I, I would like to just say, we've, as uh, Rob mentioned, we have a number of meetings with our town managers. <laughs> And uh, Jeff uh, Bridges, your town manager has been extremely vocal for a number of years, which we completely agree with in terms of our benefit packages for our employees. So we have made significant change. We have the first tiered system ever implemented in October of 2015. Any new employees after 2015 pay more for their pension. Um, we still have a lot more to go, and, and we've said that to, to Jeff and the other town managers. We're actually meeting tomorrow uh, we've been meeting with our actuary and our uh, uh, pension uh, people so that we can try and find uh, some options uh, that mirror the, the changes that our towns have made. Um, our, t our union contracts are expire in January of 2017, uh, sorry, 2019. 19. We have asked our uh, union members to come to the table a year sooner. Um, so we're on the pension side, we're looking um, uh, our pension program provides about a nine and a half percent benefit to the employee. So the existing employees prior to October 2015 pay 5% for their pension for a 2% benefit. Uh, so they're really getting, it's a, it's a nine and a half percent uh, benefit, they're paying 5% so they're getting a four and a half percent benefit. New employees after October uh, of 15, they pay 7%, so now there's a two and a half percent benefit. We have asked our actuary to, to look at options on, on defined benefit plans of eight, nine, and ten percent, and she had basically said, you know, if you if they pay ten, new employees pay ten percent, there is they're actually losing money. So there was a couple of other uh, options that they're proposing, which is a defined benefit plan slash defined contribution plan, a six percent uh, contribution by the by the employee and a two percent contribution by the MDC, that provides about a two percent benefit to the employee. So we're looking at those kinds of options. We do know OPEB is a major, major component to, in, to, the, to the cost. Uh, the MDC pays about $10 million in benefits for active uh, employees for medical and about $6 million in OPEB. We recognize this. We, uh, we have a couple of options. We know that uh, utilizing the 30-year the, the liability that we have today, um, uh, that represents about $86 million liability to our OPEB. Uh, the proposal we are having uh, her look at is um, uh, to cut that liability in half. Um, she's got a couple of options for us. Um, and we're going to be meeting with our unions tomorrow with our uh, two key members of our PP&I board, the, the chair and co-chair. Um, so we are addressing this issue. We have brought, as this, the chart show, we have brought the staffing level down 
uh, to where we believe we, are, uh, we, we can perform our work. Um, and we do know that we have uh, work to do uh, as suggested by the town managers regarding benefit packages. So we're working on that. Uh, and uh, we are no doubt MDC is behind the curve of our towns. We recognize that and we're, we're working towards that goal. Okay. Any further questions? Sure. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, it looks like you went up 8% from 2016 to 17 in expenses and then 10% including the 2.5 million that you discussed um what could we expect in 2019 because some that's that's 10 percent to the town of weathersfield the, it was just 10 percent expenses up overall yeah that's 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 a combined between the water rate increase and the avalor right. so that's that's a total increase uh of water and sewer yeah i get that yeah, yeah. but it's yeah. still yes eight percent mm -hmm. and then ten yeah. percent yes so I hear what you're saying about getting it down, but can somebody talked about affordability and that's not really affordability for the residents yet. Um, would some of those things get it down in 2019, 20 to like a two or 3% because from the slides, it doesn't really look like Is this that. on water or sewer? I'm both. Yeah, I'm both. To get, well, it, well to get to water's driven, water's driven primarily by how much we sell. It, it's, it's, it, the more we sell, the lower the rate is. It's a simple situation like that. We should increase. Now, there's a, there's a clean water, or not a clean water, there's a state water plan that's, uh, that will be reporting to the General Assembly. We have the largest amount of water in the state of Connecticut. Connecticut has available water. The problem is they don't have water in the right places. Yukon, major problem. Tolland County, major problem. Fairfield County, major problem. So when they make recommendations on where that water is going to be sold, I would assume that they're going to be using our excess water capacity in other places in the state because it's, the, it's something that Connecticut is going to have to deal with. So again, I, I can't predict what kind of environment you're going to have with water if you have, uh, if you have a, a drought or drought type of a situation, we'll sell more water. If you have excess rain, will sell less water. So it's driven by, by, uh, by supply, how much, not supply, I'm sorry, by um, demand. demand. On the sewer side, we can be more specific because we obviously, what we're talking about with the consolidated or the integrated plan would give us more relief on that side, which gives us more control. So it looks like in the short term, we'll still be going up significant percentages and then maybe in the long term we'll go down a little well, bit well, yeah, the debt service the debt service, debt service is, the biggest driver. is a driver so, so unless we can get control uh from from deep uh to to go, go to an integrated plan we're going to need to spend approximately 35 million dollars a year on the sewer uh general sewer system which is about two and a half million dollars of debt service so it will increase over 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 time yeah, you. Uh, just to clarify, so we mentioned on the slide. Would you come up to the microphone, please? Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> so, as we saw in the slide there, um, the debt service we talked about doing, we're issuing a bond next year in July or August for $120 million. We issued a, a, a bond this past November for about $100. $108 million, which impacted the sewer side by $5.2 million and the water 2.1. So it all depends on what projects we're bonding. So because we're issuing that debt in August of 2018, that will impact your 2019 ad valorem and so on. And again, so that, as you saw in that slide with um, the black chart and the, and the tan, there will be a significant increase on the rates for 2019 because it's not part of the integrated plan. Debt service is the biggest component. So in future, the goal is not to have that hit ad valorem because we are going to continue spending this money um, to do the infrastructure, as Scott had mentioned. You know, we're trying to reduce that from the, the $130 million down to $40 million a year. But the, for the answer to your question, yes, there will be a, another spike in 2019 because of the debt that we have to permanently fund. Unless Thank you. Yeah. Unless yeah. Unless it's, it's, well, it's, go ahead. No, I know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Councilor Lester, did you have a question? Yes, please. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, 
appreciate you guys being here in your presentation and appreciate the important work that the MDC does. I have two questions. The first is on the timing of the meeting and the second is on the recent history of the ad valorum taxes. So first on the timing, um, was there any consideration given to doing this earlier so we could have gotten the presentation before the vote today and had the opportunity to talk to our representatives about the budget and the issues? Yes, uh, yes. Well, we, we, Go ahead. Yeah, we we um, uh, we uh, uh, we proposed uh, uh, on no, uh, September twenty uh, second to have a meeting with all of our towns, uh, and we uh, the the two towns that uh, not including Wethersfield, but the two towns that did not request us to come in front of them was West Hartford and um, Rocky Hill. So uh, unfortunately, I understand the dilemma that Wethersfield had is that you have a whole new council. The council was ap appointed November 13th. 13th. And so the, the challenge was getting in front of you uh, before tonight. Unfortunately, uh, the timing was not good, but we would have liked to have gotten in front of you before well, the 4th. It wasn't the timing. The meeting had been scheduled, and we were bringing 35, 40, 50 people together in a process and we were asked to delay it and I said if there was something that was significant we would look at doing that and there was no representation that there would be a significant <coughs> issue that was brought to us so we were not going to trans we were not going to postpone the meeting for that kind of a situation we would have had a special meeting bring people all the way back because we had already scheduled the meeting and scheduled the public hearing and everything else well, hopefully next year we can have. Listen, we will we will we will come whenever you want. I mean, it, we understand you're a new council, and we had that discussion, but uh, the logistics of changing that meeting was very, unless there was a significant issue, and I raised that question, and there wasn't a significant issue. Um, my so last we, question. Uh, thanks. My last question, and I may have missed it, but did you sow the recent history of the ad valorem taxes for the last like five years? Be interested to go back. I know it's eight percent approved today, but uh, we don't have that on this slide. But we can give that to you. We're more than happy, we can send that through. We, the we have that, don't we? I didn't. I right. didn't see it, but slide. on this slide, okay. But but if you if you look at the uh, the slide that Rob had, um, this is um, I need my reading glasses. I'm sorry. Um, this this is this is even though. The customers, this is not clean water project, right? This is Avalorum payment. Uh, so most people don't understand because uh, they pay their taxes to the town and the town gets a bill from the MDC for the cost to run the sewer system. So this is really an equivalency of it. And I, I, and I, I don't know if uh, Wethersfield is about 2% roughly, but if, if you pay, pick a number, $10,000, approximately on your your property taxes approximately two percent of that ten thousand is related to your avalorum bill so this is just an equivalency of avalorum and it shows by town what uh members each individual are and, and and the important part of it it is it, it, different for each town because avalorum is based on uh, your tax base right but the important part is the tie and bond, which is an engineering architectural firm uh, in Massachusetts, and they do a study nationwide to compare rates across the country. They show that we're below the average for Connecticut. Significant. Thank you. Can you get us the last yes. like three to five years sure. going yes, back? We can. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and, and if you look at that, that, that number on that chart, we are substantially below the state mean. But each town is different, and that's predicated on state legislative formula. That's in the statutory language that we deal with. That's not MDC's uh, <coughs> formula. The formula is in the, in the statutory language that we deal with. Understood. Thank you. Are there other questions? <coughs> Have, uh, thank you, guys, for coming in. Having this slide up and talking about the, the legislative statutory formula, so Hartford I would presume consumes the most water and has the highest discharge for the sewer, but only pays $94 ad valorem. Yeah, that's predicated on the grand list, and the grand list has, uh, a, there's a, a sort of a, 
it's 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 not a con it's not consistent with state statute in the sense that there's 20 years ago there was adopted a differential uh, tax rate based on the uh, the uh, assessed value of property in the city of Hartford because if you look at the mix in Hartford Hartford has 87 percent of its prop it's is commercial and the other 17 and a half is residential so in the year of shift in the year of revaluation there's shift from commercial to residential that was done and it was an issue so that you really have assessed value the assessed value is 70 percent statewide if you look in Hartford with the differential the assessed the assessed tax or the assessed rate uh, and that's the 70 percent is actually only about 33 percent or 32 percent on residentials in Hartford so that's a uh, that's because of legislative consideration also Hartford has significant uh, funding that comes into that to that community that has an impact on the uh, three-year average of receipts that comes in and it's that that's the formula so the residents are being supplemented by the, the businesses that are paying right. a more right. higher percentage the of, business of, of the Avalorum component. Right, the businesses right. that and, pay. And if yep. you look at this chart, you look at Hartford, the median household income in Hartford is $28,000, right? The median household income in West Hartford is 112000 but the people in Hartford are still paying that $380. So you look at, we talk about that affordability, 2%, right? So the Hartford resident is paying identical to what everyone else is paying, but yet their median household income is, is a fifth of one of our, uh, our um, lar largest uh, uh, community, uh, communities, West Hartford. So that's why we have said to EPA, this isn't fair. We have to consider affordability for eight towns, not uh, it, which individually, not just the average of all eight towns. Okay. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Scott, question for you. Sure. I'm trying to remember all the various projects you've got going along. One of them, is one of them still uh, stormwater, wastewater separation? So in, in Hartford, in Wethersfield, um, we don't have any separation projects. What we did in Weathersfield was we did a lot of pilot programs in the, in the communities off of, um, of Silestein, and we were lining pipes, and we were replacing it. pipes, and we were lining laterals to homes to try and get the most cost-effective removal of stormwater out. The projects that are going on here are really building large capacity right. so you can capture. The separation projects in 2012 we decided that we couldn't meet the deadline mandated by us um, at the time it was, it, it by was the 2021. Uh, uh, we couldn't meet that mandate by EPA and by the state. So we proposed in order to achieve the goal and the time frame that they were giving us was to build the South Tunnel. So we aren't doing any more separation work. We're proposing to go back to separation. Uh, but again, you need EPA and the state to agree but, that they'll give us that extra 40 years to do it. But, but that would be basically in the downtown area because that's going to be the, la the last area that we're going to deal with. But is Harford the last area to do stormwater and wastewater separation? Or are there Har other towns as well? Har Har Harford, Harford it's the only is, one. That yeah, Harford is a, is a, a CSO community, so they have one pipe capturing stormwater and sewer. So all of the separation work is done in Hartford. Everybody else is separated. Everybody else Everybody is done already. Separated. Right. So the stormwater uh, well, par mandate. Well, parts of West Hartford have, right, have, have some Right, that's of West Hartford. But the, but the stormwater mandate that we call MS4, <coughs> which is the next clean water project, will, which gonna will impact be. the towns, not the MDC, except in Hartford, uh, that is to deal with your stormwater, which we don't own. Well, because I know many years ago, MDC turned around and gave the towns all a list of streets where you know the stormwater and wastewater were combined and correct. we had to separate them ourselves That's correct. through our capital projects yep. we did every one we had in Wethersfield yeah. right. I remember uh, it was before Jeff came here when Bonnie was still uh, the manager I had to go to a meeting at MC when you were planning your grandiose yep. project and I asked a question I think there were more than just Hartford and West Hartford at the time and I said when you do the chargebacks for that you should take into consideration towns like Wethersfield 
that did their due diligence yep. and separated their stuff at their own dime so that we're not paying for the work that the other towns didn't do that they shouldn't do. Right. You're so, referring to stormwater from wastewater the separations. Yeah. Right. So the, a lot but of that's, towns that's have not over years, uh, taken their street catch basins and connected to our sewer pipe, which you know we can't right. do in the non-Hartford towns. Well, so that's what you're referring. Well, to. we we also clean the sewers in Hartford. Uh, that that. But remember, the Hartford system everybody uses and comes through the Hartford system, and that's one of the reasons we've going to the tunnels too. We're, and, and of course, we're, we're not, we're, we're opposing the construction of the North Tunnel because of uh, several conditions that we're in discussion and debate uh, and disagreement with uh, DEEP now. So it's, it's a process and, and we're the only major city in the state that has been, been brought to compliance by virtue of state and federal mandate. Uh, in, Every one of the cities has this problem, and they're going to have to deal with it. And from an economic development standpoint, it's going to be a major problem for all of these urban areas dealing with economic development because sewer and water are the critical pieces, the uh, components of, of economic development, without which you can have, you can have development uh, without a sewer, but you can't have development without water. So, you know, those are the issues that we're dealing with. And my with. only comment, too, is that once you get the stormwater and wastewater separated, your taxing on your treatment plants is going to go down. And which will if we can help if we can eliminate these, the amount of water coming that's right. into it. Yeah. So I mean and that's, get that's that the groundwater is always a problem. And, and as we developed this project, listen, we originally developed it. When you get into the field, you find really the problems and that's what this has been. This has been a work in process. Um, and what What's happened is we've changed this. We went from separation to tunnels, uh, and then we'll probably go back to separation in certain parts of downtown Hartford uh, to, to resolve the last part of this issue. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Councilor Forrest. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Thank uh, you. I'll try to be as brief and direct as possible. If you could just turn to slide 12, please. Yes. I need my readers, sorry. Yeah, yeah I still I can't see. I don't even know what number are we it's on. In the what? bottom right, it actually had a twelve on it. Yeah, but I can't see it on here. What what number are we on? Uh, it doesn't have one on this particular one. So. Okay, what slide are you looking for? Twelve. It, it had a list of adopted versus actual budgets. Uh, okay. Water, yep. Utility, yep. It was not the rate one, but yeah, here's the revenue. This one. Yes. There there it is. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Water and utility and revenue. This was okay. The revenue, and then uh, where was the um, expenditure section? Uh, probably the one before it, right there. Is that right? Yes. Um, so I'm, we're looking at, it seems to me, between the 2016 actual and the 2017 adopted, it's uh, 12 million more, 141 to 152, 11. And Rob, you want to answer this yeah, question? 141 to 152 is 11, a little under. So of the, of the 11 million increase, um, or about 8%, I think we talked about. What portion of that is driven by the debt service increase, essentially the bonding, in order to do you know, some of these major projects? So on the second line item there, you can see the debt service in 2016 was $40 million. In 2017, it jumped 40. to $48 million. So, so is that, got it. So eight of the 11 or 12 is due to the debt service. Now, that's, is that's that- correct. Is that driven by, and I might have missed the connection, is that driven by the clean water project? No. So the clean water project is outside of this normal capital, so, and that's covered by the three, $380 that Scott referred to. Um, this is uh, all, improvement. yeah, this is just basic capital improvement, either water or sewer, that's outside the clean water project. So the water portion would so be covered is, by- is, is any of this consumed in the clean water project? No. No. Okay. So there, is there additional expenditures from that project, which is sort of helping the MDC move along, right, that are not reconciled in this big alignment? There are projects that are outside of this. These are, these are the operating budget to run the plants um, and the watershed and so on. The Clean Water Project is a standalone project which is funded from the Clean Water Project on yeah, your okay. charge. So, but, if, but that's still really like kind of money <coughs> that you guys are expending. It may come from and be accounted for in sort of a different section, but 
if we were to look at like, what the MDC is allocating toward our systems, it's more than the 152. That's correct. So on an annual basis, as Scott mentioned, we're spending about $110 million on a clean water project. We send, spend approximately $70 million on CIP. There's 25 for water, um, 35 for sewer, and then there's about 15 million for combined. And then, then you have the 167 million just for the operating budget, just to run everything. So when you look, look at that, we talk about that 2% median household income. Yeah. What that means is that, so we have two, two op budgets, right? We have the operational budget, which includes all the things to fix and run the sewer system, plus the mortgage payment to pay on that $35 million yeah. a year, which is two and a half million dollars. And, and then we have the clean water project, which is a quote, $2.5 billion program. And the 2% says that your sewer charge and that bar charge, it shows $90 in Hartford and 300 and something dollars in, in West Hartford, mm -hmm. that that plus the ch cost for the clean water project should not exceed 2% of the median household income. Yeah, I was yeah. more interested in the actual numbers of expenditures and yeah. where they're going. Sure. Right. Not so, so on the capital side, the 35, 25 million that we keep referring to comes through the debt service line item within this operating budget. So if I spend $70 million to build pipes, I go out and bond it, the 70 million, and you'll see it in the debt service line here. Right. As part of an obligation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you have, is there like a consolidated sheet for the MDC then? Where you consolidate all these and so you can get I don't want to say a truer picture because this is untrue, but a yeah. holistic picture. Yeah, is probably yeah. If you go, if you go to our CAFR, which is on our website um, under the Investment uh, Relations tab, you'll see our sewer um, funds, which covers the clean water project, our regular C, uh, sewer capital funds in our operating, and then there's also a page for the water side, so you can get all that information out of our CAF CAFR. I understand, it's, but so. it, seem, it seems to me that when you look at the billing side, we're talking about the revenues for all these types of expenditures. But when we look at the expenditure side, we're just talking about the operational on this side, and there's not a kind of a holistic approach to what, not approach, but recognition of all the expenditures that we're making and the sort of largesse of the MDC is not necessarily recognized in 11. Well, not in that, but right. we do yeah. have a consolidation. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but we don't see it. It wasn't really presented sure. today. Yeah. Well, we can provide that because we'll it's, yeah. okay. it's also in our official statements when we issue our bonds. You see the clean water project as well as our sewer and water operations as has well. There been, has there been any attempt to or uh, looked into the renegotiation of the debt that currently exists in, in the future? I know we, we do that on sort of a regular basis to see if we can get a better interest rate. So how is the MDC handling sort of the current debt service and so its we, interest rates? So we do um, pursue refunding. We actually anticipated doing a refunding in 2017 in hopes of saving about $673,000 um, due to the fact that we've got, got uh, downgraded as well as market conditions, we were unable to do that refunding. Well, we but we got tangled up in the heart condition. Exactly. So we do look at our opportunities. We did a refunding um, last year, uh, so we do try to pursue refunding when, when it's available. But because of the Hartford issue, we've had a tough time doing it. Yes. Well, well if, if you but look at, at the eight-member towns, they always go to your weakest town okay. when, when they're making an assessment of your capability of doing something. I mean, we should be AAA, but when they put Hartford into the mix, you don't, you don't get that. And Rob yeah. mentioned that that cost about $500,000. If we get downgraded again for August of, of 18, uh, we're going to deal with that as well. Well, but that's why it was so important that, that what, what Hartford's trying to do is going and hopefully bring Hartford out of what the, where they are, and it's going to be more stressful than $40 million going into this, this year's budget that was put in there. Uh, when you look at the pilot, a community with 53% of its tax base, a uh, nonprofit, it's, it's got the same size uh, tax list as uh, Glastonbury or Farmington, and it serves the major services it provides. So there's got to be a series of, of amended amendments to rectify that issue as you go forward. And it's not easy in the process, but they've identified the problem they're working on. And um, for, uh, you know, council, like any town really, understanding what your five-year guide plan looks like for us to be able to budget appropriately is very helpful. Um, to have these large bumps up and down, up and down. I mean, the down's fun because you know it gives you a little bit of more room to work with. But to be able to smooth that out, ten percent, eight percent, you know, year after year after year is very difficult. So if you could please provide us 
what your best guess is or your best ability to find to see what a five, nine year, ten year guide plan would look like for our budgeting purposes would be very helpful. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Thank you for the presentation Thank tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so it looks like we do not have any um, resignations or appointments to boards and commissions. So we can move to um, B2B. Do we have a motion to take technology purchases off the table? Uh, Madam Mayor, can we move B2B <coughs> off of the table and on to 4A of our agenda? Is there a second? Second. <coughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed or abstaining? Okay, the motion passes. Um, if we can move to <coughs> item B3A, the agreement between the Town of Wethersfield and Connecticut Natural Gas for an Energy Conscious Blueprint Grant. Mayor, can I move to approve the Energy Conscious Blueprint Connecticut Energy Efficiently Fund, Efficiency Fund Program grant in the amount of $95,013 for the Wethersfield High School renovation project? Do I have a second? Second. second. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Um, this is very similar to the Eversource agreement you saw at your last meeting. Uh, Connecticut Natural Gas has come out and evaluated the energy improvements we've done to Weathersfield High School, and based upon those estimates, this is a uh, rebate incentive that they are offering. The design engineer uh, will have to come out with Connecticut Natural Gas to verify that all these improvements are in place. And once it's done, they will write us a check. Are there any questions? Councilor Hurley. How much between CNG and CLMP did we get? 122 plus 95. Now, those can be used on anything for the? Under our charter, um, what it says is any grants that we receive have to go against what we borrow on the project. So. For instance, this evening you have the technology. Uh, rather than doing a three-year lease to purchase the final uh, remaining technology, we would use one of the, the proceeds of one of these grants to purchase the technology. What makes this project different than prior renovations is that the, at the beginning of the project, the state required us to bond or have authorization to bond the full amount, not the amount we anticipated uh, having to spend minus the state reimbursement. So in this project, we got 74,000, 74 million authorized rather than the 44 we would have, or uh, we would anticipated spending. So it would go against some project cost, okay. but it eventually reduced what we would have to borrow. Okay, I had one more question. So can it be used to reduce the 922K that we got a reduction from the state? by paying down our debt service for the Wethersfield High School? I don't know. Okay, because that would be over 20% of what we're going to get hit with from reductions for the state. So that would seem maybe that might be a good thing to do at this point. Yeah, I don't know if that if those grants can be, I know they, can go against what we would have to borrow, whether or not they can be used, applied directly to debt service. I imagine they could through a, a budgetary procedure. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Oh. Aye. 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 The town manager. <laughs> well, I'm just mechanically going through this process. We haven't realized the revenue yet. Um, 
Yeah, we would just have to work that out mechanically. Probably easier to do it next year than it would be for the current year because you'd have to discount the debt service payment by a certain amount. But okay. mechanically, we'd have to work it out. Could we have another vote, please? All in favor? Aye. 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 Sorry. Any, any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion passes. Uh, may have a motion for B3B, Cloverdale Pond. Motion to transfer $9,804 from the underground tank replacement project to the Cloverdale Pond project and transfer the remaining $81,405 in the underground tank replacement project to the salt shed project. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, both projects are completed. Uh, Town Engineer Derek Gregor is here to answer any questions regarding the project, but we are short of funds in the capital budget for drainage, so we're, we're proposing to take what we need for Cloverdale Pond out of the tank project, which has uh, funds left over, and then move the rest of the tank money to the shed money because we need a new salt shed at some point. So Derek can answer any questions on the, on the projects themselves. Are there any questions? Or you stayed for the whole meeting. <laughs> I'll ask a question. Okay, right. it's okay. I'll Thank you. Latina. <laughs> With this um, transferring of money, if you will, will this allow us to finally start that salt shed project? Will that get us to the monies that we need? The recommended budget we had for the salt salt shed project is about five hundred thousand um, dollars. To date, we've allocated about three hundred twenty-five thousand, so we're going to be just over four hundred thousand. Um, as far as getting a better number on what we actually need, we have started design. Uh, we've done the survey out there. Um, we're starting to look at some different manufacturers. So we're at the early stages, but um, you know, as we get a little further along, we have a better idea if that if that money would uh, cover the cost of the project, or if we will need to set aside another uh, hundred thousand dollars as originally anticipated. So we'll have some better information on that, you know, in the coming months as we get further through the design. Deputy Mayor. Uh, Derek, because you said you're, you're doing the costing right now, would you have a finalized number ready for when uh, you go before CIP with all your projects, do you think? Probably not, um, just because we do have to, there's going to be a lot of coordination with DEP on this for permitting. Um, as many of you are aware, our, our transfer station and our uh, physical service facilities in the floodplain. So to, to build the shed where we need to, it's going to have a significant impact on the floodplain and the, the variables going to be as to what extent the permitting is going to require us to expend additional money to off compensate in flood storage or either that or uh, go through some detailed engineering hydraulic analyses to determine what kind of impact, if any, this will have on the overall floodplain. So for that reason, I think it's going to take a little bit longer to actually get to that number. Um, uh, so I don't expect that would be having that information probably not going to be available for this upcoming session okay councillor forrest um thank you mayor can we expect when we build the shed to have any operational savings from this new set of capital expenditure or is it simply we have a better shed to do our job well the the shed that exists now is is very old it's been uh it's been shored up a number of times um in talking with the director of physical services, I mean, I think it's gotten to the point where it's gotten to be a safety hazard almost for the uh, employees that do work in there. Um, as far as operationally, uh, that's hard to say. I mean, really, you know, what, what it is it's just a covering basically keep storm uh, rainwater off of the salt, prevent it from leaving the site. Um, I think it'll be an improved as far as we'll have better lighting, better access. Um, you know, for, from an operational perspective, I can't speak to that. I'd have to speak with Ella Katz, but um, I think I, I certainly think when we have the opportunity to redesign the site and lay it out different than it is now, we'll have an opportunity to try and make it more efficient for getting trucks in and out in that respect. Thank you. So is the anticipated start date on this 2019? We don't know yet. We'd have to get the engineering done and see what it's <coughs> going to cost. Yeah, the permitting is going to be a big uh, component of what's going to drive the timeline for this project. Um, I, I'd say best case it would be the end of 2018, but most likely I would plan for 2019. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilor Latina? 
I don't even know if this has ever even been talked about. Is there any other place we can put the shed? Well, <laughs> I'm, st I'm still learning the town myself. I'm not aware of anywhere else. I mean, obviously, you know, it being in the floodplain, the whole facility's in the floodplain. It's not the ideal location for this facility. Um, you know, those are some discussions that we'll have if there are other opportunities, because, like I said, the permitting on this is going to be pretty extensive. It's a large area. We don't want the shed with it below the floodplain, so we have to build it up above the floodplain. And anytime you reduce storage capacity in the floodplain, you have to offset it by providing additional storage capacity somewhere else, which may mean excavating out areas to offset the fill where we need it. Um, otherwise, we can go through some detailed engineering analysis, and if we can demonstrate we have less than a 12-inch impact on the flood levels, then DEP sometimes will allow that without the comp compensatory storage. So it's something we will be discussing. At this point, what we're trying to do is just kind of get an idea of what type of shed we want to use, the orientation and layout, and get some preliminary grading done so we can start these meetings with DEP and figure out, you know, what, what they will require if it's going to be here. If it becomes, um, if it gets to a point where it's too cost prohibitive or um, the they're, they're not going to be reasonable as far as what we can do. That might be something we have to seriously think about. But like I said, it's very early in the early stages. I, we really even had, had, I've had one internal meeting just to get, kind of kick it off and get us going on some surveys. So we're at the very early stage of the project still. But we are working on it now that the fuel tank project's behind us. That was our next big project uh, down at the physical services facility. In your course of research, maybe just finding out what other surrounding towns have salt sheds that might be accessible to us? might be a shared service just getting the salt back and forth at 2 a.m. when it's snowing makes that difficult just putting it out there okay okay thank you are there any other questions if not all in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed any abstain motion passes thank you thank you uh, the next item is B3C, purchase of equipment for two police vehicles. Do I have a motion? Um, yes, Mayor. I have a motion to, um, let's see, motion to, to approve to release $28,000.54 um, and 86 cents from the CNF equipment reserve to purchase equipment for two police vehicles. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Manager. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, the town <laughs> purchased four cars in the spring of last year, two of which we had uh, enough money to out equip. The expectation was remaining funds from the 2017 budget would be available to purchase the equipment for these two cars. Uh, the council did put aside the money from last year's budget into the reserve fund with the expectation that it would be used to equip these two cars. We we're requesting the release of those funds. Other questions, Councilor Rell. Um, is this a uh, a contract, uh, a bid contract with MHQ um, that we're looking at here for the twenty-eight thousand, or it says a an estimate on top of the. Um, yeah, if we need an extra piece of cable or some other things, but this is the standard equipment we put in all the cars. Physical Services does most of the work. Okay. This is just the parts. Did we go out to bid for any of this? Um, I'd have to check. We buy from MHQ each year. It's who's available to buy, the, purchase the product, and I think it's on a state bid list. Okay. I'm just looking at some of the um, recommended uh, purchases. Um, I just don't know if we would get a better deal by going out to bid on s some of these. Or if this is um, this typical cost? This is so typical cost for We've these seen products. this before? Oh, yeah. Okay. It's identical to the equipment we put on the other two cars. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, if none, uh, may I have a vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Any abstaining? Okay, motion passes. Bids, 4A, do I have a motion? Yes, Mayor. I move to approve the purchase of Chromebooks for the Weathersfield High School for a cost of $122,994. Do I have a second? A second. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. Council, as part of the Winter Weathersfield High School renovation, the educational specifications identified one of the goals is uh, rolling out technology one on one for the students. Um, a portion of the technology purchases were put on hold until the end of the project to make sure sufficient funds remained in the project budget. Um, there are funds available in the technology budget for this. Um, the school and the high, Weathersfield High School Building Committee are requesting the uh, purchase of the computers. Thank you. And we have the chairperson of the Board of Ed and yeah. Keith, I'm sorry, I don't know your title, technology, technology director. director here with us. Well, hi, um, Bobby Granado, and I'm here as the uh, Board of Ed Chair. Um, I'm very pleased to have an opportunity to talk to you about this because I know it has been tabled quite a few times and we'd like to really get all the details out there. Um, speaking for the Board of Ed, I'd like to address the specific question of why does the district want one-to-one, -one, a classroom where every student has a computing device provided by the Weathersfield school system. I first want to address the Board's philosophy on one-to-one -one and how it relates to our vision of education in Weathersfield. The board continues to work to transition our school system into the requirements of a 21st century learning and the challenges of educating our kids to be 21st century students. What exactly does that mean and what is the board doing to achieve these goals? Well, most importantly, we are working to expose our students to the many and changing opportunities of this new century and the diversity of roles they must play. We are living in a time of an incredible change in nearly all facets of our lives, but perhaps most profoundly in technological innovation. There is an epidemic, epic transformation occurring in the world of technology for which our students must be prepared. Do you know our kindergarten students will be graduating in 2030 and 65% of the jobs that will be required then have not even been created? So what does a student need to be successful in a world that is so difficult to even envision? Well, the board, the administration, and the teachers are focusing on educating our students to be critical thinkers, problem solvers, and wizards of technology. Our goal is to provide a device to every student that will enable them in their reading, writing, gathering information, and communication skills, not just for social networking. And by providing a device to each student, we are ensuring that education continues to even the playing field. And you know, in second, and perhaps fortuitous, as I stand here tonight, the Journal of Transforming Education Through Technology has released its final blog that deals with the subject of four emerging trends in K through 12 education that will redefine the classroom over the next five years. And from the board's perspective, we can take these to the bank. Trend one, paper textbooks are vanishing. The truth is we're still buying them to some degree because we have no choice. One-to-one -one will change that and ultimately save the school system and our taxpayers a fortune. I think you will find it of interest to know that the textbook industry is shrinking rapidly. Publishers are cutting their workforces and sharply focusing their resources to produce digital learning materials. Trend two, digital curriculum is increasing. And it stands to reason, curriculum is the heartbeat of K through 12. So it's vital that teachers have the highest quality curriculum at their fingertips. So as the textbook industry is dying, the digital curriculum industry is exploding with growth. Trend three, access to a computer by every student in the classroom is the foundation of a 21st century learning system. It is the new normal. There is now solid empirical evidence for the significant benefits of student achievement in a one-to-one -one classroom. Again, no surprise, one-to-one -one is impactful. And hear this, in 2015, studies show that half of America's classrooms are already one-to-one, -one, and that in 2016, the purchase of computing devices will increase by 18% over 2015. If the rate of computer purchases continues, then by 2020, three short years away, America classrooms will be 100% one-to-one. Trend four. 
the world of education is changing from constructive learning to instructive learning, led by one-to-one. -one. A digital curriculum and one-to-one -one continues to increase. Teachers become more comfortable and effective in exploiting their one-to-one -one classrooms. And as they feel the growing joy of learning in their one-to-one -one classrooms, those classrooms will increasingly become hotbeds of inquiry and collaboration with monologue style teaching giving way to dialogue style teaching. And as I said earlier, this board believes you can take these emerging trends to the bank. We are sure that the direction of K to two education and are convinced of the overwhelming evidence to support the continued investment in one-to-one -one technology that we have proposed. And now, to continue this, I have the genius of the Weathersfield School System and the town when it comes to technology, Keith Raffanello. Thank you, Keith Raffanello, Technology Director. And we were here a few months ago and it was tabled. And the good news is that that was a wise decision in terms of the cost of the Chromebooks have gone down $21 per unit. So now they cost $204.99 each, which is the savings of 12,000, approximately $12,600. So now that the request is for $122,994, we get approximately 50% of that back from the state. So it's roughly 61,500. That would be um, our cost and it gives us uh, 600 uh, Chromebooks that we could put into use, you know, immediate, immediately. So the, um, there were a few questions uh, from the council. Chair person Granado answered a couple of them. I just wanted to see if I could answer some of the other questions uh, that you had about these, this purchase. Want me to read them off? Okay. Well, I, I, yeah. Two counselors want to follow up with what we've heard so far. Uh, Councilor Spinella. Can people bring their own computer to school? So, yes, that is the short answer. However, I guess the question, one of the questions that was similar to that is, can a needs-based program be implemented instead? Oh, yeah. The problem is, and it's not a problem, but it's our responsibility to add educate all of our students. So po board policy does not allow us to charge tuition or to require some of our families to purchase curricular resources. For example, we couldn't say, your family is well off, you need to buy your own science textbook. And now that the Chromebook is a curricular device, I think this is an important distinction that we don't need Chromebooks. What we need is to provide our students access to the internet. We could choose iPads, we could choose Windows laptops, we could choose Apple, Apple laptops. The difference is cost. The Chromebook is the most affordable way to provide our students with online access. Our best learning resources are available online. The way we're measured as a school district, our performance, the way it's measured by the state of Connecticut is with an online assessment test each year. So we're not asking if you think it's a good idea that we connect our students to the internet. We're saying we have no choice but to connect our students to the internet now. We've built our entire educational system around online resources. So right now, half of our students at the high school have access to these, our best resources, each day. We believe we can do better than providing only half of our students with access to our best online resources. And we also believe that the Chromebook is the most affordable solution for connecting all of our students to the internet. If we chose Apple laptops, for example, it would cost $600,000 for 600 yeah, laptops. I don't care about the kind of okay. computer. Um, is it possible there's one-to-one -one now, you're just not including the people who bring their computers to school? No. Okay. Um, why do you think that? because our teachers are telling us that there are not enough devices right now for students to... But let's say you encourage people to bring their computers home. The, 
the other problem that brings up Mr. Spinella is that we can manage the devices we provide to our students, but we can't manage the devices that they bring in from home. Right, but, but they're already bringing them in from home, right? Mostly cell phones. Okay. We don't have a I large... Mean, I don't have any kids, and so I'm relying on the other people who sure. I've talked to about this. And it seems like their kids are bringing their computers to school and not really having many issues with it. Um, and that doesn't really go with what you're saying. No, the, the allowing the students to bring their devices to school was something we implemented three or four years ago because we didn't have any Chromebooks at all at that time. But now we've implemented Chromebooks in our school district and our test scores have gone up as a result. Okay. So we want to finish the job now. And um, it would be very similar to us saying to some students, why don't you bring in your own curricular resources? In the sense that we can manage the, the Chromebooks we put out to them, we can manage what's on those computers, what the students have access to. Most importantly, uh, in, in, as Bobby had mentioned in, in, in her intro, was um, the savings that we realize as a result. I'll use encyclopedias as an example. Obviously, we're not going to provide a hardcover encyclopedia book set to $3,600 students. 3,600 students, what we have is the Chromebook at $205 that allows our older students to access Wikipedia, which is free. Our younger students to access WorldBook, which is um, $4,000 annually, allows all of our young students to access WorldBook or Encyclopedia, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica online. So the encyclopedias is just one example of how paper resources are being eliminated and we're putting um, all of that information in the hands of the students through the Chromebook device. But are you accounting for maintenance, replacement? I mean, when I was in school and you had an encyclopedia, I didn't have to replace it every three years. It didn't right. break. Right. It was always available to look at. Great point. We're getting these Chromebooks that we've been purchasing, so that we've been using them for six years. The ones that are six years old are still in good shape. We, we, a responsible plan says we should replace them every six years, but if we're still getting good use out of them, we're going to keep them, which means we're going to have to buy less of them if we get, if we extend how many years we're getting out of them. So the Chromebooks that we'd purchase with this $122,000, um, we could use for definitely six years, maybe nine or 10 years. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Um, before I take any other questions, I just want to clarify that I uh, reached out to the chairperson of the Board of Ed with some questions that I had, and that's what Keith is answering, just so you know. <clears throat> yeah. Deputy Mayor? Uh, <clears throat> Keith, uh, by having these Chromebooks one-to-one -one through the board, where we're looking, as Bobby said, to go with electronic books in the future, if we're going to get those books electronically, there's got to be a license that the board is going to get. Would that license only be applicable to board-owned devices? You couldn't use that license on a private one, probably? It depends on the resource. Uh, yeah. But some of our resources um, require licenses per device. Uh, some of our resources um, are free. and. We're looking at more and more free online resources to uh, supplement and supplant, in some cases, uh, our online resources. But um, you bring up a great question, um, Tony, and, and about affordability. Google Docs now is free. When we were in college or even, even high school, Microsoft Office was the product everyone used. And cost up to four or five hundred dollars at the time per computer to have that software. And now Google provides it all for free to each of our students. Without the Chromebook, they don't have access to that. So there are some areas uh, where um, where we will continue to pay for educational resources, but we're trying to reduce that amount each year. No, but what I'm talking about is the actual textbook itself. No, the math book, the English book, whatever. If you're going to go out and say to the publisher, now I want X number of copies, it, he's going to require they be on board ed devices, not personal devices. Yes, and the cost will, I see, I see your point, and it's very much like subs subscription services, K 
cable television. If you want to watch the Yankees, you need access to Yes Network. You don't have to do it through Cox. You can go on their website and pay, and you pay less if you do it that way. Same thing with our Chromebooks. Yes, we'll pay less by licensing some of our software, not requesting that we also get a hard copy book because we don't need it anymore now that each of our student had, has devices. And, and you're ask, I know you, the question you're asking is about manageability as well, um, how we manage these licenses and make sure that students have access um, to all, the, all of the textbooks they need access to and that it works seamlessly on these devices. We can manage that these, all of our resources work seamlessly on the devices, but we can't guarantee we can manage students' personal devices. Right. Councilor Rowe. Thank you, Keith. Yes. Uh, when we first discussed this, I don't know when. I think it was September. September, October. Um, there was mention about insurance that uh, parents could purchase uh, for the Chromebooks just to ensure that you know if something happens, one of their kids break it or something like that. How long have we been provide, or how long has the schools been providing Chromebooks to students? So this is our fifth year, and it's really a three. It was a three-step process. Back when we had no Chromebooks, we said, "How do we get to the point where we can actually take the SBAC test online in in a way that we can do it within uh, a month or two? Now we're doing it in in four or five weeks, but we didn't want it to be a five-month test because we only we have to keep circling these two Chromebook carts around the school. It's can we get enough Chromebooks to to take the test. We accomplished that. The next step has been, now let's get enough Chromebooks so every student, when they're in our classrooms from 7.30 a.m. until 3 p.m., have Chromebooks in the classroom to access all our educational resources. This request would get us there. Step three is, let's let them start to take them home so that they have access at home to our educational resources. We're not there yet. What I talked about at the last meeting was what some other towns have done. That step is going to require board policy. It's going to re uh, require some thoughtful discussion from all of our stakeholders. And how do we want to make that work? Letting the kids put them in the book bags on the buses, home, use them at home with Wi-Fi. We want to educate our parents about how to make sure that their Wi-Fi is safe at home. We know ours is safe at school to protect them from the places we don't want them to go. That, that's going to be a deliberative process um, that you know, we'll take a little bit of time. Okay, so I guess I was under the wrong impression back in September then. I was thinking, having talked about the insurance that parents could purchase, that those students that had the Chromebooks at the time, and I don't know if they were seniors, juniors, freshmen, seventh, fourth graders, who, who has, well, I got a couple questions here. Sure. Who has the Chromebooks right now? So right now we have Chromebooks on carts, so we have a, uh, a rolling cart that locks up to keep them safe. It's a charging cart. When they're on the cart, they charge. So overnight, at the end of the mm -hmm. day, you plug them in. In the morning, they work, they work all day. Um, they're in all of our schools. So we, our teachers okay. sign out to use these carts. So we're not charging insurance to anybody yet because we haven't let, we've only let one group take them home, and that was the capstone group at the high school as a pilot. They were working on their capstone projects. They wanted to have access at home. It was about 16 of them, 16, mm -hmm. 18 students. We let them take them home for that four or five month period. None broke. Right. We didn't charge them insurance. Um, but it would be those kind of small pilots I think we'd do initially uh, so that we can learn from the experience, certainly consult with some other districts who have already started to let them take them home. My, my biggest concern with providing a one-to-one -one for all of our students is that we would be relying on kids, you, you know, I don't care how old they are, you know, 17-year-old, 18-year-olds, um, as opposed to third graders taking home Chromebooks. Um, you know, I see what my kids do to their folders, and it's just, you know, right. it's not, it doesn't even last a week or two, and it's destroyed. Um, what is the, is there insurability that these Chromebooks, durability, that they're not going to be, you know, broken and I mean if they're staying at the schools right now and the kids are only using them at their desks I mean I have a lot more trust in them to preserve them and keep them going for the next six or so years but if you're going to start to allow kids to take them home then we're going to be replacing Chromebooks a lot more than what we currently are if I'm not mistaken absolutely yes um, 
I think that if we just continue to keep them in the classrooms for another year, let's say we get enough Chromebooks, if this is approved, to have all of our high school students have the Chromebooks in the classrooms all day, I'd like to see the result on, on test scores after a year of them having them before we send them home. That's not only my decision, that'll be a discussion the board makes with the superintendent and the parents. Once we start sending them home, sure, some will start to break. And I, I had talked at the September meeting about what Plainville has done to kind of recoup some of the cost of those Chromebooks that are breaking. They implemented a voluntary insurance plan. It seemed to work for them. I want to circle back and talk to them again and see, because they've been doing, they've been sending them home for four years now, if they've changed any of that and, and, and where they are in terms of wear and tear. The um, initial goal here would be, wow, now our teachers can say, really? Every student has has access to all of our learning resources all day today in the classroom, that's going to be a big step for us. That's the step we're hoping to take tonight. You may want to check with, and I know Bobby and I talked about this in the past, our own Corpus Christi here in town, I believe, has a Chromebook policy where the kids can take them home, if I'm not mistaken. Have you guys looked into that at all and seen how the results of those? No, but I'd love to. We just hooked up with... Um, the uh, one of the tech folks at Corpus because they needed a smart board stand we had an extra um, so we donated to them of course with, with Michael Emmett and the board's permission um, so yeah I'd like to definitely speak with them too about Check what they're doing yes my kids are too young to take them home um, but I know of some parents who, who who have their kids they have Chromebooks in their house so I think they're Corpus kids that are older than than mine I appreciate that. We'll reach out to them for sure. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Councilor Latina? Uh, what is the plan for after six years when their useful life is up? So we've been fortunate to purchase Chromebooks in each of the past five years. Two of the years were with state grants. The state in 2011 and I believe 2015 were the two grants they did because of SBAC. 2011 being... Um, I want to get those dates right for you, Jody. So just give me one second because I have that here. So in 2013, a technology grant of 24 million, this was statewide, was funded in 2013, in 2013 where we had to apply. All the towns did. That was when they were starting SBEC. That's why they did it. They said, let's, let's help towns get some Chromebooks uh, to, to, or, or whatever they want, uh, laptops. And then a second technology grant of 11 million, so half as much, uh, was awarded in 2016. We don't foresee any more grants in the short, uh, in the near term with the state. So back to your question. So it's been five years we've been purchasing them. The other three years that we didn't have grant money, we used uh, operation, our operating budget. One of the years it was funds that were used at the end of the year when we had some excess one of the years. So. We have um, not retired any of them. We've had a few break. I want to say maybe a, a dozen or so that broke to the point that we just couldn't use them. Um, but our, our tech team that we now share, town and, and schools, um, can replace broken keyboards, uh, r uh, broken screens. There's a lot of work we can do very affordably to keep these things going. Um, so it's been five or six years. The question was, what are we going to do to maintain this? The responsible thing to do would be to budget some money, not a lot. For example, this request tonight, 122000 is approximately 6.5% of what was allocated for technology for the high school projects. This is a, a, a relatively small amount looking at the big picture, say, for example, 50000 a year in our budget of $60 million. If we start cutting that, you know what, we can't do it this year, we got to take that 50 out, then what we're going to find is six years from now, we're going to have to replace 2,000 Chromebooks all at once, and that's, there's never going to be a good year for that. So the responsible thing would be, let's make sure we keep 50000 in the budget every year just to replace the ones that we have to retire, um, and look at that as a fixed cost because the Chromebooks connect all of our students to our <coughs> curricular resources. The Chromebooks are just as important as some of our other fixed costs. I'd make the argument 
that Chromebooks internet access, let me say internet access because that's more important. Internet access is more important than lights in our school. If tomorrow you told me, well, either the lights are gonna go out in all the classrooms or internet access is gonna go out. I choose the lights go out. We have natural daylight during the day when the students are there. Without internet, it throws everything off. No online testing, no access to Google, no access to PowerSchool, no access to Munis. Everything is online now. So with internet being that crucial to how we function, if we lost internet in the Stillman building, you might as well send everyone home because there's nothing we could do without internet. Shuffle papers, I guess, but now that we know it's that important, the internet, the internet is everything, then we need to at least budget a little bit every year to make sure we have devices to connect the kids to the internet. So responsible planning, trying to make that a fixed cost and keeping that amount low would be my recommendation. And as the technology advances, will there be something else to replace Chromebooks? Hopefully they'll get cheaper. I mean, the fact that they've gone down to $200 per Chromebook, if we can get those things down to 80 or $60, man, that would be great. I mean, you think about just paper supplies and trapper keepers and all the stuff we used to buy as kids, lunch boxes. I mean, you're talking about less than $100 that would really make it easier. And it seems like technology is getting cheaper and cheaper. The problem with, we got caught a couple times in this project. When we started 2014 was the first time this board, this council approved Chromebooks for the high school project. They were $350 each. So now they've come down to 200. But one other time they came down to 200 and then the model ran out and the new model came in. They, were, they bumped back up to 260. Um, but I can, I can imagine that Chromebooks will continue to um, to get cheaper, more affordable. What's the enrollment at the high school? 1,450, 1,150, 600 and 550. We have 550 Chromebooks right now, we need 600. 1,150. About 1,180. Thank you. <laughs> now we're short 30. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? I have questions on, on funding. Probably more for the town manager. Sorry. Um, so when we talked about this, you said it's going to be taken out of the the funds that were appropriated for the school, but it says here it's going to be taken from the incentives of the 122 and the 95. Mm -hmm. What what's the? It's just going to be taken from the incentive. Well, we don't have any cash in these in this school project anymore. We spent what we had, and we so. It's the only cash we have to pay our half of the Chromebook purchase. So rather than go lease these to get the dollars, as we did with the other technology, we would use the cash on hand, and the only cash on hand will be these incentive checks. We have three to four hundred thousand dollars of budgetary room left, but we have borrowed what we spent and spent what we borrowed. Okay, but the two hundred and seventeen thousand of incentives could be. 24% of our shortfall from the state. So I was just thinking it would be better to not have to lay anybody off or do any of those things because 900,000, almost a million dollars is a lot of money that we're gonna have to look at reducing. Those are policy decisions of the governing body. Okay. So this request is, um, is not part of our operating budget, it's part of the pro overall project, correct? Yes. Jeff? Okay. And uh, financing them over three years, if we went that route, would, it would cost financing 61000 uh, Jeff, you said would be approximately $6,000 in interest, give or take. Less than that. Less. Right, that's right. We talked about the 150 that we did in the board side would have been about 6000 so. Yeah, 545 to 51. Okay. So it would cost us $5,000 more over three years? Right, and I think if we were to yeah. lease it, if we were to lease it, yeah, it'd be thirty-three thousand or whatever one third is plus the interest. But there's a potential that we could use this other money to offset some of our shortfall. Okay. Okay, I'm just thinking, thinking of the options of we're going to have 
a big shortfall and it's going to cost us five thousand dollars more to lease these things and we'd have money to help with our shortfall 24 percent of it i think the big thing from our perspective is the state reimbursement so the state re the state right now is obligated to reimburse us half of this 122.9 i don't see any we're going to regardless of this gets approved tonight or not we're, we're still going to need these chromebooks we're going to have to buy them at some point the chance to buy them at half price is tonight the chance um, to buy them at full price is is, is um, six months from now is next year Councilor Forrest. So my understanding from that last comment is that right now the expenditure is 123, but we'll get a $61,000 rebate check if we extend it now. If we wait, the opportunity cost is actually $5,000 extra plus the 61,000. So that's $66,000 if we don't make the decision now that the town will not recognize. Is that accurate? No. 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 Not plus the five. The five is uh, the interest on the 60, the uh, 61 leasing. over three years, right? Yeah. So if we make the decision, because if, if we decide to lease, we don't get the 61,000, correct? Yes, we do. We do. We do. We do. Okay. It's just whether you use your cash to buy them outright and get 50% back from the state or you lease it over three years and get your 50% back from the state. And still the 61,000, and still that with the lease. Still the $61,000 back with the lease. Yeah, that's, that's the estimated state reimbursement either way you pay for them. Regardless of how we pay for them, we're going to get 50% back from the state. Keith, what's the, um, if we're looking forward to getting to the one-on-one, -on -one, that this kind of critical mass, what is your neck, what are the next steps by the board or really by you in advising the board as far as cost reductions in other areas, especially with the textbooks that we talk about, talked about or other cost reductions? What do you foresee? in the next year to three years and cost reductions because we finally achieved the one to one ratio. So what we're looking at is and I'm looking for dollar figures. Sure, our curriculum resources. So our AP science course, for example, at the high school, those textbooks are pretty pr are, are pricey. Yep. Nice because the textbook company did, a, did a, a good job organizing all that information into that book. Uh, curricular units that allow our students to to progress to where they need to be to take the AP exam, for example, in science. More and more of all of that information, all of the information of the world, as we know, is available online. Our job and what we've started to do is to organize online resources to make it easier for our teachers to utilize free online resources that include, so it's say three or four resources instead of the one science textbook, but gives you all of the information that's in that textbook. But four of the five of those resources are free. One of them might be a subscription service that we want to continue to pay for that's a fraction of the cost of that science book. I mean, getting down to sort of the dollars, there's a lot of what this council is talking about. What yes. do we anticipate over the next one to three years that we're going to be able to start to reduce maybe some of more, more physical budgets or subscription budgets or whatever they are. Right, well, the you must be anticipating we're getting to this moment and you're asking for this money to get to this moment and now we can. More than pay for these Chromebooks with, with the savings. I mean, GoMath alone is a great example. The board approved GoMath a few years ago and our test scores have skyrocketed. That was expensive, GoMath was expensive as you remember. When that, I think we did a uh, six, I don't know how many years we did exactly, but we did a multi-year subscription to GoMath that we paid up front. When that renewal comes around, our uh, assistant superintendent, our superintendent, our board will have to look at the renewal and compare it to available free online resources, like extra math, front row math. These are free online resources that students can use, and maybe we don't pay the full GoMath subscription because we have options now that are coming online that are free. Was there any anticipated savings by going to one-to-one -to -one and then... Absolutely. You know, what, what we don't want to buy paper anymore if we don't have to. But, I mean, aside from the understanding what they are, like what, what are the numbers? Are we looking at a 30% reduction or we're going to streamline it 5% a year as we start to like kind of wean off of these sort of more cost-heavy sections of, of the Board of Ed budget? Sure. We look at that every year as part of our budget process. We could put that together as, as we're now diving into our budgeting for FY19. 
uh, we will pull together what we've looked at over the past few years and what we're looking at and anticipating for next year and the year after and put that together on a spreadsheet for you. We're definitely looking at realizing savings once we achieve one-to-one. -one. Right now, we don't have enough devices to connect all of our students uh, to our online resources, which, as Bobby mentioned, is one of the reasons why we still are buying textbooks sometimes when we wish we didn't have to. We have an anticipation as to what type of savings we're looking at? A percent, even if it's a relative number, maybe not a whole, a whole number? I'd be guessing, but I, I'd be shocked if it was less than 30% that we're saving on, on, on our paper textbooks. And what's the paper if, textbook? If it was... What's the paper textbook sort of estimate of the budget? Well, I mean, I'm not saying, for, you know, you get to know it to the dime, but is it a million dollars? Is it $5 million? Is it $500,000? I don't remember. We don't replace all our textbooks every year, because, and part of the reason is we can't. So we're, we've been in limbo with some of our textbook purchases because budgets have been tough. Now we can, we'll have the opportunity, knowing we uh, have Chromebooks for every student, to revisit that and say, you know what, let's not buy these textbook sets that we've been waiting uh, eight years to buy and really need to buy. Uh, we'll have more options. It gives us greater flexibility. Again, the internet, I can't overstate how important the internet is right now for education. It, it is for all of society, really. Do you have any idea what the kind of textbook purchase is gonna be in the next fiscal year and what, what the request will be? I can get those numbers for you. I would talk to Sally Distoli because I don't, I don't wanna speak and then have her say, you know what, you forgot that, I'll, I'll get you that list. It's, it's significant. Our textbook expenditures over the last 20 years, I think would be shocking if we put that all on one spreadsheet and showed it to you. So do we want to keep buying tech paper textbooks? No, we don't. If they're expensive. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? Councilor Breton? On the, on the, hi. On the subject of textbooks, it would seem that because they're so expensive that I would imagine that you'd sort of wait it out as long as you possibly can. So it, it just would seem, I think one advantage maybe you can't even really um, monetize this, but is, is the fact that you're going to have more up-to-date licensing with and information through these, through these Chromebooks as opposed to textbooks that, oh gee, this thing is getting outdated, we're up for a new one, but just ignore that part because now this happened in the world or whatever. Um, I think that's just, you know, just state of the art sort of 21st century learning. It just would seem that that, that would be the case as another advantage. Yeah, I think the biggest thing too is that we're talking about these paper textbooks like, like they are, um, like they're valuable in the sense that they're, they're the best option for us. They're certainly not because what's important now is individualized learning. So we have students who are gifted and talented. We have students who need reme remediation. And I'll use learning A to Z as an example. Learning A to Z is a product that our elementary school students use, and it tracks their progress. And those students who are ready to move forward, it pushes them and challenges them. Uh, while the teacher's working with a student on the other side of the room, this gifted and talented student is being pushed to reach further because the software um, is, is interactive and is um, differentiated. So the differentiated learning the personalized learning that these Chromebooks offer, we can't get from the paper textbooks. We, this is, we know, this is um, common knowledge. So, so it not only saves us money, and I, I'm sorry I can't give you an exam, exact number on what we're gonna save, but it definitely makes education better. It definitely empowers our students and teachers to do more with less, and the test scores have proven that. Are there any other questions? I hate to belabor it at 10 to 10, but you know this is, we've been grappling with this for a couple months now, and you know I, I know you guys on the board and, and Keith, you're doing a, a good job trying to mitigate some of the costs associated with um, providing these Chromebooks. And you know here we are, we tabled them in September. Um, you know the recommendation I think to all those who were up here at the time. Um, and it did come around to save us, you know, by dropping the cost of the Chromebooks. Councilman Hurley brings up a pretty good point with the lease option. And is it a lease to buy option? Would we be able to purchase these 
Chromebooks after the three years? So, the, so lease is a, is a word, so I'm, I'm going to just tell you my own definition of it. I think about the, when you lease a car, you pay for three years and then you have an option to buy at the end of three years. That's not what we've done. So we've purchased, the council has approved Chromebook purchases on three occasions starting in 2014 as part of this high school project. And on each of those three occasions, the way the town manager and, and, and uh, town finance uh, director chose to um, finance those, uh, it's called the lease, but it's more like financing because at the end of the three years, you actually own them. There's no residual, there's no buyout, there's nothing, we own it. Okay. So it's a straight 36 month. We do it with the cars, trucks. Mm -hmm. So we could finance these over three years. It would cost $5,000 additional for all 600. Maybe less, yeah. Maybe, Maybe 4,500, yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's yeah. not get Jeff knows better hand. than me. Let's not yeah. get too out of hand. It's somewhere 45 to 55. Five and get the the fifty percent back from the state, and we would still get the fifty percent back. So let me just put this in layman's terms: we would l finance these for five thousand dollars over three years, own them outright after those three years, get fifty percent reimbursement from the state. God willing, the next budget does not cut that. The current budget that we just got. Governor was um, incentivized to cut funds from the municipalities, of which he cut $922,000 to us. The bulk of it to the Board of Ed, if I'm not mistaken, 60-30. So we could take that CNG and CLMP funds of $122,095 for $217,000, offset the cuts to the Board of Ed, no, your your only your only possibility with those dollars is to somehow apply it to the debt service. Okay, so we could then apply it to the debt service. We that may be able to apply it to the debt. Again, you're talking about current year current year activities. Yep, against money we don't have yet. Okay, so that two we don't have the we don't have the cash from. Yet. Could, I hate to put a motion to the table, but could we, how long would it take to figure out whether or not that 217 could then offset? We'd have to have a conversation with bond council. I'd much rather. But it still could, right? I mean, pretend that that is not even in the equation. What we're asking for is to buy something we're going to buy anyway and then finance it for three years. Don't touch the 200 whatever thousand it is. Mm -hmm. Just have the town borrow the, the 60 one, five, and which with the interest would be 66 five. We pay that over three years, so $22,000 a year mm -hmm. to get us where we need to be now, as opposed to waiting till next year. We do it out of our operating budget on the board side, pay the full 122 all at once, don't get any reimbursement. We're still going to buy them, or we're going to keep begging because we need them. It's not a, a, a need that's going to go away. Um, like I said, I'd rather have it than the, than the lights. So it's an important on our priority list. We're going to buy it eventually. I can promise you that. I don't know if it's going to be six months, five years from now. We're going to get them eventually. Get them now, get the state to pay the reimbursement because you're right. We wait till next year, they'll probably cut that too. I don't know exactly how that works, but it seems like a lot is getting cut. Right now, they're on the hook to give us half of what we spend on these Chromebooks. Well, this is the last expense, new expense, of the high school renovation project. There may be some cleanups on some change orders and outstanding issues, but this is the last purchase <clears throat> the building committee is going to make. So, Jeff. If we make this motion tonight to approve the purchase of the Chromebooks for Weathersfield High School for a cost of one twenty two nine nine four, would we be able to do that with the intention of leasing and have you come back to us with the lease documents but approve the purchase tonight? Yes, as long as I'm somewhat... Um, 
reassured that there's, there's going to be five votes to approve a lease document or else, you know, there's really, well, then we'll pay we, for it out of the project. Fund. Could we amend the motion um, in some way to indicate that we would? I think if the, if the motion. consensus is. If you want to approve the, the purchase of these with the expectation it's going to be a lease, then make that motion. That way we'll just get the lease ready. Just so you know, the only other issue is that the quote, um, the Tom Andrew asked me to get an updated quote, which was the quote that brought the price down to 12.6. The quote's good for 30 days. So if it went past the 30 days, we'd have to get a new quote. I wouldn't want that to mess it up if it came in lower or maybe higher. If this stock runs out, the fourth generation Dells is what we're purchasing. If those run out and now they go to fifth generation and they go to 260, I wouldn't want that to mess this whole process up. And would a lease, would a lease plan extend the time? frame it'll take about 30 days to get the lease put in place we do shop the rate amongst the banks we use so there'll be some time involved in that but you know 30 to 45 days we should have it worked out so you do the PO after that or or the we do the PO and then work out how you're gonna borrow the money right yeah because in the past, it's taken about 10 days after you've approved it to get the PO. Then we lock it in with the manufacturer to make sure they have stock and um, get them and in the hands of the would come into play. Councilor Forrest. Um, I've had a lot of discussion here. Uh, I'm just going to weigh in on my thoughts and on my decision. We've talked about possibilities of purchasing it today. We talked about the purchase of purchase lease situation. Um, if I'm weighing the equities of the discussion, and I want to thank I think Councilor Rell and some account Councilor Hurley brought up some excellent points as far as everyone else, as, much, as well as everyone else here. But if we look at the possibility of losing the reimbursement over a three-year process, which we are losing all kinds of uh, various benefits from the state, that risk in association with the, um, mid what, my, what I'm going to say is the anticipated mitigation of textbook expenses as we move into the next fiscal year, which is even going to be a more difficult year. And I would anticipate that if we can approve this tonight, that that would be the first thing tomorrow that the board, of, I wouldn't even more than anticipate, I would expect that the Board of Education will be able to move on textbook mitigation uh, plans because now they will have the one-to-one, -one, which they can now use that. And I would expect that that over at least the next two year period will even pay for the cost of us um, in the purchase of this. In addition to sort of in fulfilling a commitment that we have, this is a part of our big bid specs from the project. It was approved by the town of Wethersfield as an expectation that we would incorporate a full um, cadre of technology in the high school and in the curriculum. And this is a fulfillment of that promise. Um, and the fact that we now put again now at a risk that the quote that we got, which I think is very reasonable, $200 per an item uh, ish, um, if we were to delay it to put all of those four items at risk, I think would be overwhelming than the possible benefit. And I'm going to say possible benefit because I don't think something like this in an operational type of uh, ongoing purchase is appropriate for financing and then paying a bank essentially extra. Um, we do that with larger building of buildings, of course, because we have to stream, uh, streamline that process, not streamline that process, we have to smooth that process. We can't spend $20 million extra for a new town hall or a school. But if we weigh those equities, and I think today should be the day that we approve this, we improve our schools, we allow the Board of Education to do their work in reducing our budget for the next fiscal year, and we also take away the risk in the areas of the reimbursement not coming back in the 61,000 or it's some percentage of it, and we fulfill our commitment to the Board of Education and what the town wanted in this renovation project as the last item. So I would. I would suggest that this council move forward with this project for those reasons. Council um, Latino. I, oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. I didn't see you. <laughs> uh. That's okay. Um, I think all the discussion is very valid. What I am very concerned about, though, is that we would have to somehow make up in our general operating budget monies to pay that debt service. And I don't want to have to choose between Chromebooks and teachers. I would much rather have a human being. I agree with you, the internet is the way. 
Unfortunately, we are at this really bad time in our state, and I think that these decisions are extremely tough, but I, I just think that we have to go the lease option, and I'm not ready to just buy out. I think we have to allocate the monies appropriately. There's a lot of moving parts here, but this is gonna come back, and I would rather have teachers. I don't wanna see layoffs. It, and it doesn't seem like there's that much risk to leasing these computers. There's no risk. There's no risk. So I'm, I'm not sure why we wouldn't lease. I've always been under the impression if you have cash to spend, spend that before you borrow. And the cash is there in the account. So the expectation that we would use this towards debt service in the current year was not something we anticipated. I totally agree with you, Jeff. If we have cash, uh, I don't agree if you have cash, just spend it. But if you have cash that needs to be spent on a certain item, spend it. That's what I meant. But if we have a nearly a million dollar deficit or a million dollar cut staring us in the face, then lease now without the risk to help offset any drastic cuts that may be coming down the pipe. So I would support the lease option as well. Councilor Lesser. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Town Manager, can we apply that money if we lease to the debt service? I, what? I don't know. I'm, like I said, we're going to have to have a conversation with Bond Council on how we do that because we're take, what we have to do is, and I'm, it's an accounting issue, and Mike may know better than I do from an accounting point of view. We have money in the budget for debt service, which includes monies for, from the premium we've earned, right? And general tax money to pay debt service, some of which goes towards the high school, some of which goes towards other debt items. We would have to find a way to discount the amount of tax money that goes to debt service and replace it with these funds. The downside is next year, you're gonna have a $217,000 hole in what you budget for debt service. That's because we've structured the premium over the next three years to be equal. So our debt service isn't going up, but it isn't going down. We've leveled it off in the current year with the expectation that it would go down over time, but not go up anymore. So next year, you're gonna have to find 217,000 more dollars to be able to do that. Or we use half this year, half next year, because the it doesn't seem like the state's going to give us any more money than they did this year. Okay. <coughs> Either way, I think the lease option is good. That's fine. I'm good with the lease. Okay. That's what everybody wants to do. Gets us to the same spot. Are there any more comments? So, town manager, um, how do you... How do you suggest we go about doing that then? If we were, if our intention was to lease them, what would we have to do with the motion? Just say with the uh, expected uh, expected funding source to be through a lease. You probably have to have a motion to amend. And do we have a motion? Or do we have any more discussion on the lease? Do we have a motion to amend? Motion, <clears throat> motion to amend uh, this uh, the current motion to add to it to purchase these through a lease purchase arrangement. Second. Are there any other questions? Comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 No. Any abstentions? I vote no as well. I have a roll call. If you'd like, sure. Okay. On the uh, amendment to have it done um, for two out of five, or at least, is that what you want to do? Yeah. Yes. Okay. We're voting on the motion All to right. amend. All okay. right. Councillor Bradman. Aye. I'm sorry? Yes. Yes. Councilor Forrest? No. Councilor Hurley? Yes. Councilor Tina? Yes. 
Councillor Lester? Yes. Councillor Rell? Yes. Councillor Spinella? No. Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Martino? Yes. And Mayor Morin Bello? Yes. I have it. And now we're going to make a, now we're going to vote on the amended motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 No. Is that one no? Just one okay. no. I voted no. I don't yep. know. The mo <laughs> motion passes. <laughs> <laughs> Whew. That was tough. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Appreciate you coming tonight. Thank you. And thanks for the four hours to stay. Yeah, the next <laughs> staying open. know a lot about the MDC now. We do. Okay. Uh, um, next, may I have a motion for the minutes of the November 13th Town Council Special Meeting? Move acceptance of the November 13th, 2017 Special Meeting. Second. Who was it? Yeah. Matt, you weren't here apparently. It's all right. I still made the motion. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any? Noes, any abstains? Okay. Do I have a motion for the November 13th Town Council Organizational Meeting? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Are there any additions, corrections, or deletions? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstentions? Any noes? And finally, the November 20th, 2017 Town Council regular meeting. Do I have a motion? A uh, motion to approve the minutes of November 20th, 2017 Town Council meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Are there any corrections, deletions? Okay, all in favor? Uh, Aye. 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 Any abstentions? No. Okay, very and, good. Uh, move into executive, motion to move into executive session. Public comment. Public comment. Public comment. Sorry about that. Jump in the gun. Sorry, my bad. Unintentional. <laughs> <laughs> it's just on our list. <laughs> Do we have any members of the public who would like to speak? Mr. Colantonio. Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. I know it's late, guys, but. I have to say what I got to say. Uh, very interesting meeting, you know, informative and whatnot. Uh, and I just have a comment because uh, Councilor Latina asked the question, says, uh, do we have any other locations uh, to put uh, the salt shed, I guess, you know? And uh, the town engineer did not really know. Uh, I don't think he did the homework. So my understanding is that, you know, we're going to design this uh, salt shed at the existing location and then we're going to go for permits. And then we're going to see how much it's going to cost. And then probably we cannot get the permits. And then we start all over again. Why not see if we have a new location and design it from... Hey, why impact something like, you know, within the floodplain? Because, you know, every time you go for a permit, they make you jump through ropes, this and that. So to design something and then not being able to build it, uh, I don't think it's the, the right way of doing it, you know. Uh, regarding the, the MDC, interesting too, you know, uh, the things that really jumped to, to me was that uh, basically they are trying to reduce personnel, uh, but yet the benefits and salaries of, uh, you know, from one year to another, they're going up. You know, that, that's, that's, I mean, you know, it's, to me it's worrying because it seems to me that for the past 10, 15 years, in private sector, the, the wages that I'm not going any place, but any place else goes up. That's, uh, that's, that's, not, uh, that's not correct to me. Another thing too is that, you know, I was brought up to conserve, you know, in any way you can. And, and you know, I have a, a wood burning stove at home. Can you imagine that? And I save some oil. Now what they're doing is you use less water while we got increased uh, the rate. So that's what we need. I think it's ridiculous. So I'm going to save oil at home, but my oil man is going to say, well, you only use 500 gallons instead of 1,000, so we're going to charge you the same. How much sense does it make? I mean, that's what they're doing. To me, it doesn't make any sense. But anyway, 
Regarding the stop sign, now, again, it's, it's just a paragraph. <laughs> again, you know, this is the, the police report. It says, 290 feet distance that you can see from Orchard looking towards Silas Dean. Okay, you cannot see, I can only see 290 feet, and you need a stop sign. That's what the report says. But yet, they never checked it. From Orchard, as you look up, which means that you look up, that means like, you know, the grade goes down towards Silas Dean, okay? And that means if you have to stop, it takes a little bit longer. You can only see 232 feet. So 232 feet, you don't need a stop sign. 290 feet, you do. How much sense does it make? To me, it's, it's crazy. Now, the town engineer is no longer here, so he cannot even answer me, but I guess, you know, people don't care. Another thing, too, I found out tonight that uh, basically somebody was, uh, this, is, this is funny, I think, uh, somebody was traveling from uh, on Wal Walker Hill Road, let's say from Maple Street, all the way to Manchester, and they went to the computer and says, how do I get there? You know what they said? You go up Walker Hill Road, and then you turn right on Morrison Avenue, and then you turn left on Silas Dean to go there. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that, why this computer said, you go along Walker Hill Road, you take a right on Morrison Avenue, you go to Silas Dean, you take a left, and you hop on the highway, you know, 384 or whatever it is. Even the computer, when I said all the time that the conditions and, uh, and basically the existing condition of Morrison Avenue versus Hillcrest is not even a comparison, and yet, the town over eight, nine years, you haven't done anything, and I tell you, I will not go away. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colantonio. Anybody else? Mr. Young? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. This issue over the uh, Chrome computers was nothing, not, I mean, you couldn't tell me that this guy Keith didn't know that he was going to be approached or approach you on the idea of financing and that that was all going to fall through. Um, you can't tell me he didn't have that planned, nor, did, nor could you tell me that you folks didn't have that planned because you had no cash. From what the town manager says, how else could you buy them? But then, who cares? You go out and you mortgage yourself more and more. But that's how the town of Wethersfield is. Keep mortgaging us. You know, you have no cash. You're up here whining. And why are they whining? Have you figured that out? Poor management. Poor management on the side of the prior town councils and members who are sitting here from those prior ones, as well as the building committee and, and the board of ed, all poorly managed. Wait till last minute. I know they were here in September, but they had no money anyway. They knew they were in a budget problem. And they knew that the only way they're going to get this through is more financing, which is something that Weathersfield doesn't mind doing, because what do you get back? Some kind of bond premium? If they were good managers, and that includes the town manager and the town council, you wouldn't have gone and, and rented office space for the transitional academy. You would have put them in a town-owned building that didn't cost any money. Currently, you put on hold, because for the season, that the $35,000 in paint job on the, the Standish House. You should have given the Standish House back to the Standish family because we don't get the $41,000 from Lucky Lou for rent. You would have been nice to have that $41,000 in our, in, our, in our revenue bucket for tonight. It would have been nice to have the money the money that's going into the Transitional Academy rental. Those are just two items that I'm thinking about. Instead, who cares? In the end, we'll get it anyway. I've heard that before from the co earlier councils, and that's how it is. 
Now, one thing that was said was our, respons our responsibility is to educate all students and Chrome books are the best way to achieve those goals. That was mentioned tonight by Mr. Keith. But I think there's other ways of educating children than with, with Chromebooks. Put it off for a while. You, they currently have books. It's not like they're going out buying new books. And this one-to-one, -one, as the Madam, Madam Chair had said, you know, she wants one-to-one -one throughout her school system for, because of the 21st century. I mean, I've been hearing this for quite a while now. I mean, these few little buzzwords set off the thoughts of pay cash or, or pay through financing. And that's exactly how our town is operating. Now, tonight you also had the MDC here. The MDC, who is totally out of whack as far as the economy goes. What are they talking about? 8% one year, 10% the next year? Didn't they, didn't they hear that our car taxes went up from $32 to $39 to next year $45? Tell me, who's going to go buy a new car when you know you live in a town that your, 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 your tax rate is roughly $40, but for your car, you're going to have to pay $45 next year? No? Is you gonna, are you going to drop it? Are you going to drop it to who knows what? No, you, you, you were so eager at the, a month ago, a couple of weeks ago, to uh, bump it up from 32 to, to, to 39. Man, you guys were chomping at the bit for that money. And then, of course, we got this $380 charge uh, from this MDC that they're talking about. Uh, you know, as I just mentioned about a car, you pay 6.35% sales tax for the darn car. And then you come home and you get nailed from the, your own town for 40, uh, $39 and next year will be $45. I hope it's less or none. Maybe, maybe I'll hold you to the fire on, that where, uh, on what you said. But um, there's, there's no end. There's no end to this. And as you people were sitting here deliberating, all I could think about was those old people across Weathersfield who, who make a choice between, do I buy cheap hamburger or dog food? And those people, they really deliberate before they spend any money. Mr. But they don't have the financing available that you do. And you, like you- Your five minutes are up. If you would take a 20 seconds to finish take up. Take 20 please. seconds to wrap it up. Well, I, I think we, we need to look more at the uh, MDC, I think. Uh, I, I voted no on the two budgets for the MDC. What was the first one? $1.6 billion. And the second one was to bring it up to $2.2 billion. I was waiting to see how much more they want. But they're getting it anyway. They're getting it by these increases. And, and, and they said people aren't buying water. I have underground sprinklers. For the last several years, I haven't been even turning it on. I haven't even hooked it up because let the grass grow, go to hell. And you know what happens with grass, it go, turns brown. Thank you. It Mr. turns Mark. brown and uh, makes the town look worse. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak tonight? Mr. Mazzarella. Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walker Hill, I'll keep it real brief. I, uh, just a couple things on that MDC presentation. I thought that was just an absolutely ridiculous presentation. If anybody could figure out what they were talking about, I hope you could call me and share that with me. Uh, I believe it was designed to confuse. Uh, one of the comments that Mr. DeBella made that I thought was absolutely insulting, I think it was Mr. Lesser that asked, uh, the timing of their presentation versus the vote that took place tonight at MDC. And I think the way I understood it, he said, well, there wasn't really anything important that we were voting on, so I didn't see the reason to fill Weathersfield in on that. I just, that's just mind boggling. And uh, the last comment I want to make is, uh, it seems to me we ought to be able to do something about that ad valerum 
if you look at the numbers, it's just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, the way it's skewed um, should cost just as much to flush a toilet in Hartford as it does in Weathersfield, uh, unless uh, we put more pollutants into the water or something. But uh, it seems like a bunch of nonsense. Uh, the way they separate their sewage costs from their water costs, if you look at the numbers, it's 52 to 48, and somebody just drew a line down there and said, that's what the accounting costs for water, and this is what the accounting costs for sewer. I don't believe they have a clue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mazzarella. Is there anybody else you'd like to speak tonight? Mr. Rue? George A. Rue, 956 Cloverdale Circle. Yeah, I'd like to say a couple of words and, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, about uh, the performance. Oh, you can't hear me, huh? You know, one of the things, you know, my, my, my friends, they, compl they do l legitimately complain about taxes as they see them. They're sharing their thoughts and ideas with you. Myself, I've almost given up. Almost. But one of the things that really disturbs me is has got more to do with the policies, how we run our town. I think it's really, I, I, it infuriates me when, and I see it as a sheer sign of disrespect when all of, practically all of you, Mr. Forrest, practically every one of you, you sit back and you more mumble and you, you think you'd give the citizens an opportunity to kind of figure out what you're talking about, maybe even if, even if they don't understand it. And some of us, now half the time you don't understand because you can't hear it. And I really, I, it really, to me, is almost an affront. We spend money like there's no tomorrow, and is there no any reason why each of you couldn't wear a little mic on your neck so that we could hear you? I've heard it said it costs too much. And maybe it does cost a little, but we spend money, a lot of money. I go to church, and I can hear that minister. He's got a little mic on him. He doesn't have to scream. But you know, it's like we're not even here. And you wonder sometimes, how come the turnout is low, Mr. Spinella? I, I think you touched on a very sensitive note. I really do. I think people just don't give a damn. They say, you don't listen, you don't care. And people have told me that. What's the point in going? They're not listening anyway. So I share those thoughts. If nothing else, I'm not going to argue with you spending money here, spending money there, but at least show a little respect to the community at large that are trying to listen at home and the people that are here so they can hear what it is you are saying. That's enough said. And I love you all. Thank you, Mr. Rue. Any other public comments? I'll take, oh, in the back, come on up. Hi, um, I'm Dr. Megan Hartline. I live at 149 Walcott Hill Road. And I do just wanna start by saying that Google Maps does indeed route you through Morrison Avenue anytime you're trying to go south from my house. Um, but more than that, I wanted to say that um, I'm a faculty member at Trinity College and as a digital literacy scholar, I'm really excited to see um, you guys voting for the Chromebooks at, for the public school students. I think that's really incredibly important. I have seen firsthand in my research the impact that, these, that this kind of technology can have on students, especially underserved students who do not necessarily have this kind of technology at home. And I'm really, really pleased that um, this community that I've joined has decided to support that movement. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Then I would take a motion to go into an executive session, please. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So can I just remind you that the council rule is 11 o'clock? This is going to take 10 minutes. Okay. This is okay. quick. Very good. Just Thank you. you. Well, we I anticipate so. <laughs> All right, clock's ticking, Jeff. <laughs>